Up until last December, I'd worked for over 10 years in disability benefits compliance. My job was, essentially, periodically checking on people around our region who were receiving state disability benefits to make sure they were being honest about their disability. They were complying with medical recommendations to mitigate or treat the disability and that there were no irregularities with regards to their care or the benefits they received. Usually, the in-house visits were fairly short. Most of the real information was coming from forms filled out by their treating doctors and a review of their current medical records, as you can't reply on self-reporting when it comes to these things. Still, occasionally, you would find someone who needed more help than they were getting, or that you could prove was being dishonest just to get free money. It wasn't exactly a fun job, but I at least felt like I was performing a necessary, if boring, bureaucratic task. In the past few years, we've started having to assess cases where the disability claim doesn't fall into the traditional categories of physical or mental issues that we've had since I've started the job over a decade ago. Rather, the qualifying mental disability category has to be expanded to include moderate to severe mood disorders and severe phobias if verified by a psychologist or psychiatrist. I'm not the final say on whether these people are truly disabled or not, but when I hear that the biggest problem they have is that they won't go outside, I admit to being skeptical. My last visit in October, Jerry Rhodes, had that very problem. They called it agoraphobia, and I know there's more nuance to it than what I'm saying, but it boiled down to the fact that, except under very rare circumstances, such as a medical emergency, Mr. Rhodes had not left his home in five years. I was surprised when I first met him. I'm not sure what I was expecting, but it wasn't the friendly, outgoing man who greeted me at the front door and brought me into a clean and cozy living room. I commented on how nice everything was being kept, especially by a man living alone in his early thirties, and he just laughed and nodded. Told me that, since he stayed here all the time, he tried his best to make sure it was a good place to stay. Over the next 30 minutes, I conducted our standard interview. Diagnosis, treatment, activities of daily living, therapeutic routines, outlier behaviours, difficulties and concerns, and finally, satisfaction with benefit services. He answered all the questions cheerfully enough, and while I appreciated his cooperation and even found myself liking him as we talked, I couldn't get past the fact that he seemed so... normal. He didn't seem afraid. He didn't seem anxious. He didn't seem like anything was wrong. In fact, the only thing I noticed is that he kept looking at his watch. He'd wanted to meet me earlier in the day, but I had to push it back at the last minute. Maybe I was keeping him from something. Still, I found my curiosity getting the better of me. I didn't think he was necessarily lying about having a phobia, but I did wonder if he was getting over it a bit more than he had let on, or if he really was as bad off as the reports had said. Had he always been this way? It wasn't one of my standard questions, and I could tell he was starting to get antsy as it got later in the afternoon, but I pushed ahead to one last topic. Do you know where your phobia came from? Jerry had been glancing out the window, and when he looked back to me, I could see the first signs of true nervousness there. Giving an uneven laugh, he shrugged. Where does any phobia come from? I guess I just have bad wiring. He gave a slight shrug before continuing. Do you have any other questions? Because it's getting late, and I'd hate to see you getting home in the dark. The man was watching me intently now, his tongue darting out quickly before disappearing again between his thin lips. I tried to give him a friendly smile. I understand, and I appreciate it, but back to my early question. What I mean is, were you always afraid of situations outside of your home? And if it developed later, can you point to something that caused it, or did it just come onto you over time? He looked out the window again briefly, before letting out a deflated sigh. Not meeting my eyes, he sunk back into his chair. No, not always. Something happened. Or, oh, I remember something happening. Though the doctors say it's not true. That is just my mind coping with the trauma of losing three of my childhood friends. 
I felt my eyes widen slightly in surprise. You lost three of your friends when you were younger, or more recently. Jeremy did look at me now, his voice leaden. Oh, no, when I was young, eleven. I lost all three of them the same night, though others would disagree about that too. I didn't understand what he was talking about, but I was interested. Besides, I only had access to his records for the last five years, but there had been no mention of delusions or schizophrenia. If this was a sign of some new issue, I needed to document it so he could get help. Jerry, do you mind telling me about it? He just stared at me for a moment before shaking his head. You won't believe me and it would take too long. It's getting dark and you need to go. I debated internally. I wasn't trying to be rude or stress him out, but I didn't want to leave without at least trying to find out more about what was going on with him. Jerry, I'm just trying to get the best picture I can. I'm not here to judge, but if I don't get all the information I need, it could affect your benefits negatively. This deepened his frown. I held up my hands. I'm not trying to pressure you, just encourage you. I want to understand what you're talking about, that's all. I won't judge you or what you tell me, okay? Seeing him look at his watch again, I added, And this is my last question. If you tell me what happened to you and your friends, I'll go right after, Scout's Honor. The man stared at me for several seconds before giving a defeated shrug. Fine, if you want to hear it so much, I'll tell you. Then you'll think I'm crazier than you already do. When I was 11 years old, I went trick-or-treating the day before Halloween with my best friends, Matt and his brother Gary, and their cousin Jessica, who, funnily enough, lived in the next town over in Jessica's Resolve. We had all gathered up at my house at 6 o'clock and had been turned loose on our own with a strict proviso that we weren't to go further south than Green Street or further west than Harrelson Avenue. We were pretty good kids and we looked out for each other. Our parents knew the most trouble we were apt to get into was eating too much candy on the way back home. Things went great at first. We had all put effort into our costumes that year, and it showed. Matt was a skeleton, Gary was a ninja, Jessica was a fairy with gossamer wings she could move a little when she wiggled her shoulders. I went as an executioner, complete with a black hood my mum had made, and a big plastic headsman axe I had gotten from the dollar store. The area we planned to cover was large, but it was also dense. There were three good-sized neighborhoods, plus a few side streets and dead-end roads that had more houses to try. At first, we were regularly running across other groups of kids doing the same things we were, but by eight, that number had dwindled. We were far from my house and pushing the limits of being able to get back by our nine o'clock deadline, but our thought was that this area would be less picked over too. Lots of kids didn't go out this far, despite the fact that there were some big houses tucked back on the smaller roads, and big houses, in our expert opinions, meant better candy. For a while, our plan seemed to work. No one else was out anymore, and the houses that answered the door were given out the good stuff. Two more roads, and we would have been done with the best haul we'd ever managed. That's when we saw the other group of trick-or-treaters. At first, we just noted another group of kids traveling in our wake. We'd leave a house, and if we looked back, we'd see them hitting the same place a few minutes later. And yeah, there was four of them, just like us. But we weren't missing out on anything because we always got candy first. But as we made our way to the end of one road and cut over towards the next, Jessica pointed out that they were gaining on us. It was said as kind of a joke, but we all heard the nervousness in her voice. We weren't babies, but walking around at night on Halloween was still kind of spooky. The fun kind of spooky where you made dumb jokes and were glad your friends were with you. But when she said, They're gaining on us, guys. Her voice was different. It had picked up a thread of less fun, nastier fear. And we all recognized it because we were feeling it ourselves. We picked up our own pace as we turned onto Eveling Road. 
No one said it aloud, but as a group, we decided to try avoid these other children if we could. When we went past the first house without stopping, no one, not even Gary, complained. We were ready to go home. They could have the rest of the candy. I was the one who looked back and saw the group behind us, even closer now. They were passing by a well-lit and decorated house, and in that light and lesser distance, I could see more detail than I had before. I looked where I was going for a second, and then turned back for another look. No, I had been right the first time. Damn, they're wearing the same costumes as we are. A palpable tension began to grow between the four of us. No one said anything for a minute, but as we were reaching the other end of the road, Matt glanced back. He pulled up his skeleton mask when he turned around, and I could see he was scared. Damn, they are. They look like us. They bloody look like us. We made another corner in unison, all walking so fast it was almost a jog. Our plastic bags filled with candy, smacking our legs with a rhythm that matched the pounding of our hearts. Gary and Jessica glanced back again, and it was Jessica who finally asked the question we had all been pondering for the last several minutes. What do we do? Gary shrugged, the casual gesture not matching the troubled look in his eyes. We just ignore them. It's probably just dumb luck or someone trying to scare us for Halloween. He paused and then added, But, um, we should go on home anyway, not give them any more fun. Matt was already shaking his head. I don't think so. Who do we know that knows what we were going as and would do this? Something's wrong with this. We need to get help. Jessica glanced back again and sucked in a breath at what she saw. They're getting really close. I... There's no help out here. We don't know these people, and those kids haven't done anything yet. We need to just get back to Jerry's house right now, fast. I looked over at her, trying to keep my voice low enough to not be heard by our pursuers. Are you saying we should make a run for it? She went to answer when Gary cut in, his voice high and panicked. He looked back again. Oh, oh God, Jess. It looks like you. We all turned around then, and he was right. While the other three had their faces covered with masks or hoods, the fairy's face was largely visible beneath dramatic makeup. This close, it wasn't just someone copying Jessica's costume. It had a face too. We all broke off running, and at first we stayed together. But then Matt fell, and Gary stopped to pick him up. Jessica and I would have stopped too, but there was no time. The other group was running now, almost catching Matt and Gary before they got back going and cut down a side street. The double split as well, and now me and Jessica were being hunted by the fairy and the executioner. I... I lost Jessica on the way home. I'd like to say it was a mistake or an accident, and I guess it was in the sense that I didn't want to leave her, but... I was a real fast kid, fastest kid in our class. When I looked back one last time, I saw them gaining. I yelled for Jessica to come on and I let go of her hand. I told myself she'd catch up, that I was just going ahead to get the door open. We were less than a hundred yards from my house by then and everything would be okay. I just needed to get home. I made it there safely and when I opened the door and looked back, no one was following me anymore. No executioner, no Jessica, no one. I ran into where my parents were watching a movie, hysterical, and I started telling them what had happened. It took a few minutes for them to get what I was saying and realize that I was serious, and that's when they called Mike and Gary's parents. Had they seen their children? The tone of the conversation was first fear and worry, but that changed within a few seconds. My father pulled the receiver away to give me a half-irritated, half-amused look. They're fine. They all just came in over there. I wanted to feel relief, but I didn't. The next day at school, none of them were there. And when they came back the following week, they were all different. I tried to tell myself I was being silly, 
or that maybe they were mad at me because I'd left them, or they were scared about it and didn't want to talk to me and be reminded of it. But I didn't really believe any of that, because they were all different. Not just because they ignored me now and barely responded when I tried to approach them, but look, this sounds dumb, but they didn't move right anymore. They didn't smell right. Everything about them was off. But when I tried to tell my mother that one time, she just gave me a patronizing hug and said she was sure they'd come around and start being friends with me again soon. Two months later, they were all pulled from school. I hated to admit it, but it was almost a relief. I'd already made sure to avoid them outside of school, and not having to worry as much about them catching me between classes or on the way home made life a bit easier, especially when I got my parents to start picking me up from school like they had when I was younger. I never heard why they left, and while I'm sure my parents talked about it, they did so discreetly. I think back then, they still thought it was all just about their son having a falling out with his little friends. Then, three years later, Jessica murdered her little brother and committed suicide. It was big news in Jessica's resolve and empire for a while, but like everything, it faded with time. Four years later, when word got around that Matt and Gary had recently disappeared after years of, quote, mental issues, it was little more than trivia for most. When they were killed in a police raid six years ago in Indiana, they had four women in their basement. All of them had been tortured and murdered. It didn't even make the local paper. I've kept track of them all this time, carried the guilt about what happened with me. And yes, it was traumatic. But to answer your original question, my agoraphobia just started five years ago because that's when they first came back for me. Jerry broke off talking as he looked out the window. He visibly paled as he stood up. You need to go, now. It's dark, they'll be here soon. Walking closer to the window, he put his hand to his mouth as he looked back at me. He looked terrified. Jesus, they're already out there, it's too late. You have to just stay here until morning. I'm so sorry. It was my turn to feel afraid. There was no way I was staying over with this delusional man. Grabbing my bag, I headed for the front door. Sorry, Mr. Rhodes, but I have to get going. I saw he was moving to stop me, and I yanked the front door open and rushed through it before he got the chance. I half expected him to grab me from behind, but instead... I felt a whoosh of air as the door slammed shut behind me. Through the door, I heard Jerry, his voice high and trembling. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. It was then that I first realized I wasn't alone. Standing at the bottom of the porch steps were four small figures, all dressed up for Halloween, even though it was several days away. A skeleton, a ninja, a princess, and an executioner. I wanted to turn around and knock on the door, ask Jerry to let me back in. But no, this was all some prank or... I didn't know what. But I needed to act rationally about it. Forcing a smile, I tried to keep my voice light as I stepped toward the front of the porch. Hi kids, out for some early... Send Jerry out. The words froze in my throat. That voice hadn't sounded like a child. I wasn't sure what it sounded like, other than it didn't sound like a little boy or girl, and it made my stomach clench so hard, I gasped. Swallowing, I made myself try again. Kids, I think Mr. Ro Send Jerry out. I felt my vision swim this time, and I had a panicked moment where I thought I might actually fall. If I fall, they'll be on me and... No, I had to keep... That's when they began walking up the steps. I leapt off the porch and ran to my car, never looking back. 
never stopping until I was across town and home behind a locked door. I spent the rest of the night looking out my windows, but I never saw anything out of the ordinary. Two months later, I saw in the newspaper that Jerry Rhodes had disappeared. It worried me at the time, but I tried to chalk it up to his mental issues. Maybe he had finally run off somewhere else, and wherever it was, I hoped he got some peace. Either way, I was done with him and whatever he was caught up in, and that was the important part. The next morning, I found a note posted on my front door in red, childlike scrawl. It wasn't signed, but I knew who it was from. And I knew what it meant. I quit my job that week, and by the end of the month, I had moved across the country. I spent the last few months dreading the anniversary of that day I met Jerry Rhodes and the things that stalked him. And I should feel safe here. No one from Empire even knows where I'm at. But last night, when I looked out at my lawn, I saw four small silhouettes outlined in the moonlight. They stood there all night, silent and waiting. I don't know how it worked for Jerry, how often they came, why they couldn't get him sooner, and what mistake he finally made. But I do know they are patient and that they keep their word. Because I still have the note I found that morning, just a couple of days after Jerry finally lost his siege. Its message was simple, both a promise and a threat. Just one single line in the colour of faded blood. See you next October. It started a while back, but I didn't notice. Or maybe I did, but decided not to worry about it. I've always been an anxious person. When I was a kid, my doctor told me I had an abnormally large amygdala. Or the doctor told my mom that, because I was a kid. It doesn't matter. Anyway, I've always been the type that imagines something lurking in the empty room or tells the other elementary schoolers a ghost lives in the bathroom. So, at some point, I think around 16, I decided to stop caring about anything. I was an anxiety alcoholic and I needed to get sober. If I worried about locking my car at night, I worried about a demon living in my attic and that my neighbours might be stealing my Wi-Fi and mail and about the Yellowstone supervolcano. So, just like an addict, I needed to abstain. I just can't worry about my car being locked or paying a suspicious overage charge. I need to stay clean. The trade-offs are nothing compared to the week my life would be otherwise, but It's amazing the things you won't worry about when you've conditioned yourself to live this way. So keep in mind that when I say this all started when Mark Whitley moved in, it might have been a whole lot earlier. I live alone in a three-bedroom house, the same one I grew up in. When I was 18, my parents moved from the master into lot 45R in St. Joseph's Cemetery due to a drunk driver, specifically my father. All of my girlfriends and therapists agree that staying in the house was not a healthy decision. But rental prices are ridiculous right now and selling the thing doesn't feel right. Plus, finding a buyer wouldn't be easy. Mark was the first person I rented a room to. He was a nice enough guy, but we kept to ourselves, rarely having a conversation that wasn't about schedules or food. We had a sort of mutually understood language that kept us from needing to be too familiar. Are you going to be home? Meant, it would be nice if you could clear out for a few hours. And, what happened to the bread? Meant, did you actually consume an entire loaf of wheat bread in the two days since I last went to the store? I liked Mark Whitley, and it's a shame what happened to him. I know I'm not entirely blameless for it, but neither is he. I never hid any of the red flags. On the day he came to look at the rooms, it was raining hard, which meant the yard had become primordial sludge. 
The driveway stopped only about five feet from the porch, but I greeted him in rubber boots to make a point. He sat in his old sedan, looking at me for a little longer than would have been typical before stepping out. A mark, he shouted over the weather. His mouth kept moving, but the words were lost. What? I shouted back at him. What? He shouted back at me. It was really coming down. I shook my head and nodded towards the covered porch that was, remember, only about five feet away, and we started up the steps. It's slippery, I cautioned. Damn! The sole of his sneaker slid across the damp stone, and for a second, I thought he was going to fall and break his head open right there. Instead, he grabbed onto the railing and continued his ascent, vigilantly watching his step. When we made it through the door, he said, It's raining out there. And I nodded. No shoes, I told him. There's a rack. I don't like vacuuming. He took off his shoes and placed them on the rack. There was silence. So, this is it, I said, nodding my head for no reason. Pretty simple. Living room, kitchen, bathroom over here. His head began to nod as well and we advanced towards the hallway like two large pigeons. You own the house? He asked, curious. It's an investment property, I said. He made a humming noise, as if considering the idea. I opened the door to the master bedroom. I had had the furniture moved to storage so it was empty. This is the master. It'll be 700, including utilities, I told him. It's nice, but you can hear the neighbors really well from this room. The neighbors, what do they do? He asked. Parties mostly. Lots of weird chanting and sometimes drums. Really? He asked. Really? I said. And the other neighbor plays the trombone, but it isn't loud and is actually decent. More nodding. Is the other room quieter? Uh, yeah, generally, but sometimes there's a weird sound. Weird how? Somewhere between a baby crying and a dying cat. That is weird. Yeah, I'd go with the master. Is it cool if I have a pet rat? He asked. And at this point, it would have been cool if he had a sled team. Yeah, fine, I said. Can I move on Friday? Yeah. Okay, I'll do the master, he said. And on Friday, he moved in. Everything started out fine. His rat was named Herman, and he ran around in a little ball and used the tiny litter box. He did the dishes, cleaned up, watched a lot of Animal Planet. He'd bring up the neighbors every so often, just conversationally. Did you hear them last night? He said. This is ridiculous. Or, I left a stern note in their mailbox. Once he asked me if anyone had ever called the police. I don't know, most of the neighbors are new. I don't really know any of them. I told him. It doesn't bother you? He asked. I wear noise-canceling headphones at night. I can get you some if you want. I said. So you really don't care about the ritual sacrifice going on next door? Not even a little. Things got more heated after that. There was a slow but consistent decline in Mark's quality of sleep, as could be observed by the darkening bags under his eyes. I started worrying about him, He'd sit on the couch all night watching monkeys or something and muttering about the neighbors. He stopped cleaning up and he stopped taking care of Herman. The poor little guy was so hungry he chewed out of his ball and into a cereal box. He started sleeping in a pair of running shoes I never wore, rarely ever returning to the enclosure. But Mark didn't seem to notice. After about a month of this, I had sole custody of the rat, the dishwasher, but certainly not the fridge. I said it would be better if he left for his own sake. The neighbors were getting to him, but he begged me to let him stay. So I did. I never had a stomach for conflict, and even though I was sure he'd lost his job, he always paid the rent. Did you hear it last night? It must have been a hell of a drum circle. It sounded like someone was being murdered. His eyes were shadowed, glued to the TV like it was a lifeline. I told you, I said pointing to my ears. Noise-cancelling headphones. It's ridiculous. Do you know what language they're speaking? He asked. No, 
I try not to think about it, I said. One of the water buffaloes on the TV had been bitten by a Komodo dragon. You're unbelievable, he seethed. You don't care about anyone else. Who cares about the neighborhood? This is an investment property. Well, traditional neighborhood communities went out at the turn of the century, so the sounds I heard, I think they might be killing animals. He cut me off. The buffalo had escaped. Someone would have noticed. I noticed, he yelled. I call the police. The police don't show up. I call the neighborhood watch. We have a neighborhood watch. Not a very good one. They stopped taking my calls. How does it not bother anyone else? It sounds like they're drumming on the inside of my skull. They're just hippies or... At this point, my sobriety was on the line. No, something bad is happening there. I feel it. I'm not going to let this go. It's... I don't know. It feels evil. Stop acting crazy. Just make sure they don't get a hold of the Necronomicon and relax. Listen to Mr. Alvarez's trombone. Do you see what's going down with these water buffalo? I asked. The one that had been bitten was moving slower, stumbling, trying to catch up with the herd. A group of dragons followed it. Mr. Alvarez stopped playing months ago. He paused, watching the buffalo. I'm going over there, he said, and I'm taking a gun. I didn't know he had a gun. When I was about 13, I got appendicitis in my sleep. The pain was incredible, but my body stayed stuck to the bed like a refrigerator magnet, trapped somewhere between conscious and unconsciousness. One minute was awake and overwhelmed with panic. The next, a pack of dogs would be tearing out my intestines. I was conscious enough to know I needed to do something, but too unconscious to keep from being dragged back. The clearest thing I remember was this feeling, like a snake was coiled around my body, like any action I tried to take might cause the snake to bite. That's it. That's the feeling I got when he said those words. One moment, everything was normal. The next, it was cold, like that snake was looking me in the eyes, daring me to move. The room felt darker. The buffalo fell. It tried to drag itself up, but it wasn't enough. The dragons were on it, biting and tearing. Several times, it tried to stand, only to fall again to the hungry mouths. We watched as the gasping animal was transformed into meat. That is messed up, Mark said. I wanted to say something back, but I couldn't. I sat like a statue while Mark watched the Discovery Channel. The whole time, it felt like there was a gun to my head. I told myself it was just my anxiety coming back. I wasn't afraid of Mark, even armed Mark. I'd seen the guy remove a wasp with a cup and paper. I didn't know why I was petrified. The sun set, and like my body was running through the steps of a pre-programmed script, I explained that I wasn't feeling good and that I was going to bed. He didn't even look up. I went to my room and laid down without bothering to change my clothes. I pulled on the headphones and suddenly, blackness. It didn't feel like sleep. It felt like someone had turned off my channel. I woke up to a smell I can only describe as clean. Not like the smell of oranges after you lice all the floor. It was like the air had gone through a chemical bath. Mark was gone. Mark's things were gone. Mark's rent payments had been deleted from my bank records. The money was there, but it had been moved around like it had come from my paycheck. Mark Whitley didn't have an email or a LinkedIn or a Facebook or a website anymore. Mark Whitley had vanished. There was a skittering sound from my closet. Herman peeked out, his little nose twitching uncomfortably. His enclosure was gone. His litter box was gone. His owner was gone. All that was left of Mark Whitley was a rat. I combed through the house, looking for anything. It had been rainy lately, and the ground had been soft. But there were no longer footprints in the yard. No longer any tire tracks down the gravel driveway. Like I had spent the last week floating to and from work. That night, I slept without the headphones for the first time in years. And Mark was right. The drums felt like they were inside my skull.
I'm sure you are clever, exceedingly clever, the kind of person who would never fall for an online scam, isn't that right? Especially a ridiculous one. You know what I'm talking about. You've won a trip to Barbados, please give us your social insurance number, or I'm a Nigerian princess and I have to get rid of all this gold. No, you'd never fall for that. At the first sight of a red flag, you would turn around and run. Only naive idiots fall for such things. Well, let me disenfranchise you of all this comfortable notion. You can't run a successful scam hoping that only well-off idiots will come to you. Don't get me wrong, there are plenty of those out there. But you'll be lucky to run across one of them, let alone dozens. An average con man like myself, a self-made man really, who is only trying to get by, can only prey on vulnerable people. The usual targets tend to be grandmothers and the mentally ill, but that is something I could never do. If you scam a neglectful grandson out of his inheritance, he will stop at nothing to make sure you pay for your crime. And, more importantly, pay granny back. I can't risk that. My targets of choice are the illegals. Not that I have anything against illegals. Lovely people, the lot of them. They run away from violent situations and risk their lives to seek refuge in our country, where they are willing to do backbreaking labour for less than minimum wage. What is there not to love about a group of hard-working people who believe that all Canadians are kind and decent and would never try to take away their money? How could we not welcome with open arms these penny-saving folks who are usually too scared to go to the authorities? You've probably seen one of the dozen ads I put up on Craigslist and Kijiji. They vary in pictures and tone, but the bottom line is this. Available immediately, lovely one-bedroom apartment, perfect for international students or worker. My husband and I are missionaries going to South Africa next week and need to sublet our place urgently. We don't care about the money, we just want someone who will look after our home. Canadian $1,000, utilities included. No lease necessary. Contact Mary Morgan at... The story changes, but I find that the missionary woman is wholesome enough to lure people in. The pictures have to look realistic. No fancy condo promotional ads. A nice picture of a basement apartment will do. The price has to be below average, but not so much that it would raise suspicion. Then, you sit back and wait. You'd be surprised how many people will answer to something so ridiculous just to see what happens. But most of them lose interest when I tell them I can't meet them in person. The husband already flew to South Africa, you see. Some don't mind though and agree to meet with my cousin at the place once the transfer, which includes one month of rent plus a Canadian $200 deposit for the keys, goes through. You'd think that these websites would keep better track of this sort of thing, but they don't. And none of my targets is going to risk going to the police because they lost $1,200 to an internet scam. Some of them come from places where the police are more dangerous than the criminals, while others don't want to risk deportation by calling attention to themselves, or they're just too embarrassed and too busy blaming themselves for falling for something so stupid. To be fair, I'm sure the police have better things to do with their time, even if this got reported they'd probably think I live somewhere in Nigeria and that I'm not worth the trouble. If anyone bothered to care though, they'd find out that I lived in downtown Toronto and my little scam has been covering my rent for five months now. The last time I put one of my ads up, I got a reply within five minutes. Mrs. Morgan, I am interested in rent your beautiful apartment for the six month is still available. Amir, I smiled at the broken English and hit reply immediately. Hi Amir, thank you so much for answering to the ad. The apartment is still available, but unfortunately my husband and I have to fly to South America sooner than we expected, so I can't show you the place. However, if you are willing to transfer the first month of rent to our account, my cousin Lisa will meet you at the address and give you the keys on Sunday. You can come by and take a look at the lobby. That shouldn't be a problem. God bless, Mary. I know what you're thinking. There's absolutely no way I've been running this ludicrous scam successfully for five months. To be honest, 
Sometimes I'm a little surprised too. I think it's all in the name I've chosen. Mary. Mary is a woman, and therefore harmless. Mary is a church-going white lady who loves Jesus. Mary is pious. Mary is good. Mary is definitely not a six-foot-tall, 34-year-old guy named Richard who's only after your hard-earned money. Amir replied within 15 minutes. Mrs. Morgan is good. Do I transfer now? I move Sunday, yes. Amir. I stared at my email. It's not that I was surprised he was willing to pay. I was surprised he was willing to pay so quickly. Even the desperate and the naive needed some reassurance. They pushed and tried to find solutions with you. Maybe they could meet Lisa. Maybe they could give Lisa the money. No one wanted to part ways with their money that quickly. Something didn't feel right. But I wasn't about to say no. Just to be cautious, I sent him another email. Why don't you tell me about yourself, Amir? Is your family moving in with you? Do you have a pet? How long are you staying? God bless, Mary. Amir's reply reached my inbox just as quickly as his other messages. It was short and to the point. Hello, Mary. No family, just me. I work as clean. I pay now and move Sunday, yes? Amir. I tried to picture Amir in my head. With that name, I thought it was safe to assume he was from the Middle East. He was probably nice and apologetic, so very glad to have the opportunity to come to this country. I work as clean. He probably meant cleaner. He could be an international student with a part-time job, but most students from the Middle East were teenagers being supported by their wealthy parents. It seems safe to assume he was in the country illegally since cleaning companies didn't care about the legal status of their employees and will often pay them under the table. He had to be either small or old because young immigrant men tended to work in construction. And he was eager, verging on desperate. Maybe his temporary visa had expired and now he wanted to hide? Not that I was about to tell him to think carefully. I sent him my PayPal information and waited. The transfer notice came through and... Immediately after, Amir sent me another email. I send the money. I move Sunday, yes? Amir. I was a little shocked at how easy it had been. The whole exchange had taken less than 30 minutes. That had to be a record. You know what? I sort of felt sorry for him. I know I said the targets aren't necessarily stupid, but he was way too trusting. He was probably some religious weirdo who thought the best of everyone. Well, he'll learn a valuable lesson after this, I said out loud. My dog looked up from the floor, head tilted to the side, slightly judgmental. I pointed a finger at him. Not a word, Thanos. This will put food in your plate and beer in my fridge. Thanos huffed, as though he didn't approve of my life choices, but quickly went back to sleep. There was no arguing with food nor beer. As a rule, I block my target's email once the transfer comes through, since there will be no need for further communication. It was no different with Amir, and I went on with my life as though nothing out of the ordinary had happened. To be honest, I was feeling pretty good about myself. 30 minutes to complete a con that usually took 3-4 to four days? Clearly, my skills were improving. The very next day, I opened my email to find a message that read, Need new address. I frowned at that and opened the email. Mrs. Morgan, I went to apartment but it was wrong address. Send new address please. I move Sunday. Amir. I smirked at the screen. I wasn't worried. There wasn't much he could do about it now. I made sure to block him properly this time and continued half-heartedly searching for a new job. I planned to spend the rest of winter scamming people from the warmth of my home then find a more steady source of income in the spring. But the job ads I found online were so underpaid, I was seriously considering extending my vacation. I was still in bed, thinking whether I should go downstairs for a cigarette, when another notification popped up on the top of the screen. A new email. I saw Amir's email address. The subject line simply read, Found it. 
I deleted it without even thinking about it. That stupid app is always glitching. I can block him once I turn on my laptop. Whatever Amir had found, it didn't interest me in the least. On Tuesday, I got myself a new TV as a little reward for running such a quick and effective con. I admit that I am not at all frugal and have always had difficulty saving money. But at that point, I saw no reason to worry. It was very evident that my little scheme was working, guaranteeing a steady flow of cash into my bank account. I could never be a millionaire, but I wouldn't have to worry about the bills anytime soon. I arrived home that evening in a pretty good mood, but it didn't last. I knew something was wrong right away. I couldn't put my finger on it, but there was a little voice in the back of my mind telling me that not everything was in its proper place. Something had changed since I'd left that morning. Thanos trotted up to me, wagging his tail. Did you do something? I asked. Wouldn't have been the first time I'd gotten home to find out my clumsy mutt had ripped one of my pillows open or knocked over a plant. Thanos blinked up at me, as though wondering why I hadn't scratched his ears yet. I walked past him and took a look at the living room. Everything seemed to be in order. And yet... It wasn't. I couldn't quite see why though, and it was driving me crazy. A man knows his home. He can tell when something isn't right. I heard a sorrowful whine and felt the tip of a cold nose brush against my hand. I patted my dog on the head, but the feeling didn't fade. I must have stood in my living room for another five minutes, bewildered but unable to see anything out of place. Finally, I decided I was being ridiculous and that I had better things to do. I took a picture of my 24-inch TV and uploaded it to Craigslist. Then, I put it away to make room for the 50-inch that would be delivered the following morning. And no, I was not about to scam people again. I actually intended on selling my old TV. There was no reason to keep it around. Besides, I had tried something similar a few months before and it hadn't worked. I went into the kitchen to heat leftovers for dinner. I took a frying pan out of the cupboard and a plate from the dish rack. I stopped, lowered my eyes to the plate in my hand. The penny took a moment to drop, but it finally did. It wasn't that there was something out of place in my apartment. There was nothing out of place in my apartment. I had left that same plate on the couch after having lunch and the frying pan that was currently in its cupboard had been left in the sink since breakfast. I stared at the plate I was still holding, drawing my eyebrows into a frown. I hadn't washed either of these, and had definitely not put them away. I never did. They usually just stayed in the dish rack until I was ready to use them again. How the hell had my tableware made its way from the living room to the kitchen and gotten itself washed? found it. Something cold ran down my spine, but I knew right then and there that the thought was absurd. I had been careful. I even asked my friend Daryl, who was good with computers, to ward my laptop against viruses and hackers. I was safe. My target hadn't tracked me down, especially not to wash my dirty dishes. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong and decided to take a look at the email I deleted the previous morning. I didn't have to though, because Amir had sent me a new email that afternoon. In all caps, he announced, We have problem. Mrs. Morgan, we have problem. House is dirty. Please clean house before Sunday. And I can't live with dog. Dogs is dirty animal. You get rid of dog, yes? I move Sunday. Amir. I stared at my phone screen feeling a pinch of fear crawling up my chest and setting camp there. I kept myself from having a panic attack by repeating a less than reassuring mantra. If he'd actually found me, he'd have done much worse. Horrible as that thought might be, it was also right. If Amir had managed to track me down, then he wouldn't have wasted his time washing dishes and sending emails. At the very least, he'd have confronted me. 
it made a lot more sense for me to have forgotten doing the dishes than for him to have gone through the trouble of tracking me down and breaking into my apartment just so he could criticize my cleaning habits and my dog. As for his email, I didn't have an explanation for that. But maybe he'd found the ad I'd stolen the pictures from. Maybe he'd gone to the address on the ad and seen a dog through the window of the apartment. It was unlikely, but not entirely impossible. If he had found me, he'd have done much worse, I repeated. Thanos came closer to lick my hand. I rubbed his ears. It's fine, I told him, as though he were the one who needed comfort. Nothing bad will happen. The furniture was moved on Wednesday. This time, I could see it the moment I opened the door. Someone had moved my armchair to the other side of the room so that it was the first thing I saw when I walked in. Not only that, but everything I had left on top of the coffee table had found its way to drawers and cupboards. The curtains that were usually closed had been pushed open, allowing a lot of sun in. I hadn't been gone for an hour. I had smoked a cigarette, gone to the supermarket, then smoked another cigarette downstairs before coming up again. There was no way anyone would have had the time to do this. Besides, I had a brand new TV mounted on my wall. Who would break in and not even take that? You're a useless guard dog, I told Thanos, who barked happily at me, as though he'd done an excellent job protecting my home from invaders. I checked with the landlord to see if he'd come in unannounced, but he hadn't. And even if he had, I doubt he'd have wasted time returning my dirty underwear to its proper drawer. I hesitated, then... I opened my email. The subject line of Amir's latest message announced, Please open curtains. Mrs. Morgan, please let sun in and get rid of dog. Dog is dirty. I move in Sunday. Amir. I thought of replying. I went as far as to type down an angry message where I threatened to contact the police and get his ass deported to whatever hellhole country he'd escaped from if he didn't stay away from me and my dog. The words felt good to write, but I didn't send it. What could I tell the police? That one of the people I scammed was harassing me? No, I couldn't call them for help, and I suspected that Emir knew that. I went to see Daryl the following day. He didn't appreciate me barging in on him while he was working, but he relented after I told him someone had broken into my home and that I suspected I had been hacked. After 20 minutes where he divided his attention between my laptop and a tray of sushi, he declared that there was nothing wrong with my computer. Oh, and that I owed him $200 for getting him involved in my ridiculous scheme. Unlike you, he told me, I actually have a job I'd like to keep. Daryl was proud of the fact that he could rot away in a 9 to 5 working IT at a bank. Personally, I found that to be a waste of his talents. I returned home reassured that there had to be a rational explanation for everything that had happened, even if I couldn't see it yet. But with every step, I became a little more anxious about going back home. By the time I got to the front door, I wasn't sure I wanted to go in at all. What would be waiting for me? Maybe I should call some friends and go have a beer before... Then I started whimpering. He hurt my dog. I slammed that door open. The feeling I got when I walked into my apartment was overwhelming. It was like an icy finger had slid down my spine, leaving a trail of goosebumps and dread on its way. Something terrible had to have happened to provoke that sort of reaction. Then I realized it hadn't been dread, at least not exclusively. My apartment was literally freezing. The heat had been turned off and the door to the balcony was wide open. Thanos was okay but he was curled in the corner, shaking almost as much as I was. I could hear him whining over the sound of the wind and the snow blowing into my home. Damn it! I shut the balcony door and turned the heat back on. Even with the mild winter we've been having this year, this is still Canada. Damn, my dog could have frozen if I had taken a moment longer. Thanos ran over to me and I let him cuddle with me on the couch until we both stopped shaking. Unsurprisingly, Amir had sent me a new email. Mrs. Morgan, please turn heat off. 
Apartment is hot. Also, dog has to leave. I move in Sunday. Amir. I rubbed Thanos' floppy ears with my cold hands while I fought the urge to launch myself around across the room. That little bugger. You can judge me all you want. I know I'm far from being perfect, but at least I'm not some sociopath who messes with people's heads and threatens their dogs. I'd had enough of this. The next time he came to my apartment, I was going to be ready. I paid for extra fast shipping and got a discreet nanny cam from Amazon. I positioned it so that it was pointing toward the door and I left with Thanos. I sat at a coffee shop a couple blocks from my house and sipped my coffee while keeping my eyes glued to the live feed of my cell phone. The moment Amir walked through that door, I would get a good look at his face. I might send the video to him by email and see if that would spook him. Or perhaps I would use his first name and picture to track him down. I knew I was going to have to wait for a very long time. But it didn't matter. I would sit in that cafe for hours if I had to, only to get a glimpse of that guy's face. Seven minutes later, I saw the doorknob of my front door turn. I held my breath. It couldn't be. It was so fast. He couldn't have known I was away from home yet. Had he been watching me? Did he know where I was? I got you, I muttered under my breath. The door opened just a little. Then it paused. Maybe he was listening in, trying to figure out if I was home. But the door stayed like that for a very long time. I even wondered if he'd gotten to his knees and crawled into the apartment, since the camera didn't reach a good three feet off the floor. I quickly reminded myself that it was impossible. The door had only been a few inches ajar. A person could never fit through. The minutes ticked by. My eyes were beginning to hurt because I wouldn't blink. I was too afraid to miss something if I looked away for just a moment. Come on, come up. The feed died. I ran. The barista screamed after me and Thanos yapped and pulled at his leash bringing down the table I'd tied him to, along with everything on it. I didn't care. I wasn't about to let that man mess with my life any longer. I covered the two-block distance, in desperate, large strides that set my muscles on fire. I was so close now, so goddamn close. The first thing I saw when I burst into my home was that the camera was nowhere to be seen. The second thing I saw was a couple of ugly purple pillows on the couch, they didn't belong to me. On the table, a cinnamon scented candle had been lit and was letting out a strong, unpleasant smell. No one was in sight. Inside my pocket, my phone chimed with a new message. Mrs. Morgan, house smell nice now. Happy dog is out. I move Sunday. Amir. I flopped on the couch. The run had left me panting and lightheaded and I had to fight the urge to cry. This wasn't right. This wasn't fair. I'd had a camera pointing at that damn door. He shouldn't have been able to get past that. I should have found out what he looked like. I should be the one in control. I wasn't though. I had no control over anything. I didn't leave Thanos in the coffee shop, though maybe I should have. I went back to fetch him and pay for the damage I caused. Let me tell you, the manager was less than impressed with my I saw someone break into my house excuse. I was asked not to come back. I cuddled with my dog that night, though I was too scared to fall asleep. I had checked every nook and cranny of my apartment twice, but I still wasn't convinced Amir had left at all. My eyes kept jutting from one dark corner to the next seeing faces in the shadows and imagining two long arms extending from under my bed to pull at my feet. What was he going to do next? Was he going to hurt my dog? Was he going to hurt me? This wasn't only a clever man who could work out surveillance cameras and keep an eye on me without being seen. This was a patient man. He could have done something horrible on that first day, but he didn't. He chose to wait and toy with me. This was all very amusing to him. I did consider sending his money back. I'm ashamed to admit 
it took me that long to even consider it. But I was finally running out of options. If I returned the money, then he might leave me alone and I wouldn't have to fear coming home every day. Why should he get the money back? Whispered a vicious little voice in my head. He's a psycho and he's probably doing this on purpose. No one that clever falls for a con as stupid as the one you're running. He wanted you to cheat him. He wanted to find someone to torture. He shouldn't get his money back. And you should do whatever it takes to protect yourself. I was angry. I dare say I was angrier than I was scared. I'd taken that man's money, but he'd taken away my peace of mind and sense of safety. My punishment didn't fit my crime. It was four in the morning, but I got out of bed and got my baseball bat out of the closet. If he wanted to come back and harass me, I was going to deal with him myself. I wasn't going to go anywhere, and the moment he walked through that door, I would either scare him away or bash his head in, and I was hoping for the latter. I pulled up my armchair and waited by the door. I barely moved all day. Sometimes I would stretch my legs or pace the space between the chair and the door, but I never turned my back to the entrance, too scared he might be standing there once I turned back around. I waited and I drank, and whenever I felt bored or ridiculous, I drank more. By noon, I was out of beer and drunkenly swinging my bat at empty spaces, muttering nonsense and ignoring my dog when he started whining to go for a walk. When he started barking madly, I thought someone was about to attack me, but he was simply barking at the neighbor's cat who had wandered into the balcony. It scared the hell out of me. I grabbed him by the collar and forced him into my bedroom, where his barking became louder, then thinned into a whimper and then went completely silent. I didn't pay attention to him. All I cared about was the chance that caused that man as much pain as he had caused me. Any time now. He would make his move any time now and I would demolish him. As the minutes ticked by and I sobered up though, I began to realize the chances of him coming into my house were very unlikely while I was standing there. If he really was keeping an eye on me, he would know it would be dangerous to come in. I dared hope I'd scared him. He had to know I was armed with a blunt object and could cause severe damage. I unlocked the bedroom door and went to the kitchen to put some food on Thanos' plate. The sound of the food hitting the bowl didn't seem to entice him to come after me. Come on boy, I'm sorry I was a dick. Nothing. Not even a sound. Thanos? I went back to the bedroom and looked around. Then I looked under the bed and inside the closet. Thanos was nowhere to be found and a new email had made its way into my inbox. I move in on Sunday. Even though Amir had sent me those words many times before, it was the first time I saw the real threat in them. I don't think I'd ever been so scared in my life. There was a sense of fatality after Thanos was taken, the last shred of hope that was taken from me. Up until that moment, I could have explained everything rationally, but this I couldn't. I thought Amir had been coming into my apartment when he knew I was out, yet me being in the room had made no difference whatsoever. Worst of all, worse than losing Thanos, was that I had no idea how he'd done it. The windows in my bedroom don't open, or rather they do, but they're too small to allow a person in or my Labrador-sized mutt out. I understood for that first time that this was going to happen. I just didn't know what this was. He couldn't possibly think I was going to allow him to move in. What was he going to do if I didn't agree to move out? Kill me? Take me to wherever he'd taken Thanos? It was possible. It was very possible. I didn't sleep that night. I didn't do anything except smoke and stared blankly at a wall with tearful eyes. Finally, I swallowed my pride and sent the email I should have sent on Wednesday. Hi Amir, this is Mary. 
I'm very sorry I didn't have time to tidy up the house before you moved in, and that I didn't get back to you sooner. This week has been very busy, and the internet is spotty where I am staying. I am writing with some bad news. My husband and I have just received news that the organization we work for is being dissolved, so our services won't be needed for the next six months. We are getting back to Toronto tomorrow, so we'll be moving back into our apartment. Evidently, I will reimburse you for the money you've sent immediately. If you need to go to a hotel, just send the check to me and I'll take care of it. I'm so very sorry for the inconvenience. God bless. Mary. I reread the email several times, feeling a weight in the pit of my stomach being lifted. Maybe this would be enough. It had to be. I'd learned my lesson. There's no need to harass me anymore, especially now that I transferred the money back to him. I waited for a reply, but it didn't come. That alone was strange. Amir had always replied within minutes. Maybe that meant he was going to leave me alone. Or maybe he was angry. I couldn't know. At five, just as the sun was beginning to set, I went downstairs to clear my head. I debated whether I should do it or not, but decided it would make no difference. Being in the apartment hadn't deterred that man from coming in. Besides, I'd run out of cigarettes and the stress was only increasing my need for nicotine. I took my keys, my phone and my wallet. If he were in my home when I returned, I don't know, I suppose I'd have to talk to him or fight him. One way or another, this would be over. I hadn't taken five steps away from the building when I felt it. It's hard to describe, but it was so intense, I swear I could feel it in my bones. I think the best way to put it is heat. There was something as hot as anger being directed straight at me, piercing my back and hitting me as sharply as the cold winter wind. I turned around and knew I had to look up at my third floor window. There he was. Well, I say he, but I'm still not sure. The blinds were down, so I could only see the silhouette of what I think was a man. It was tall and lanky, its head as high as the ceiling. It had its eyes on me, staring through the blinds, projecting much more than just a glare. He was challenging me to go back upstairs. I didn't want to. I jumped when my phone chimed in. New email. When I looked up from my phone again, the blinds had been closed and I couldn't see that thing anymore. What he'd written made my blood run cold. Dear Richard, We should all learn to live with the consequences of our actions. If you had no intention of vacating your apartment for six months, you shouldn't have put that ad up. As it stands, I have no intention of finding another place as the actions of moving in and cleaning your mess was already strenuous enough. Of course, you could tell your landlord that there is a stranger in your apartment and refuse to pay rent from now on. That would eventually get us both evicted. It is your right to do so, and I would completely understand. I can always follow you to a new apartment, though I don't think either of us wants that. You have promised me a home for six months, and you have told me that you don't care about the money as long as I take good care of your home. I intend to fulfill my side of the contract, as long as you fulfill yours. Respectfully, Amir. I must have stared at my phone for an hour after receiving that message. I didn't know what to do. Somewhere inside my apartment, my new TV was turned on. I've spent the last two days looking for cheap accommodations, and I think I've found a depressing little basement in Mississauga that is within my budget. I can't afford much though. I'm still looking for a job, and now I'm going to have to pay twice as much rent. I'm not testing whatever it is that lives in my apartment now. I can only hope Amir keeps his word and leaves at the end of six months. God, I need to find a job.
It budged slightly, and I could definitely get the door open if I pulled on it hard enough, but that'll outright destroy the lock. I spoke into the phone that was tucked between my cheek and shoulder while standing in front of the glass sliding door in my kitchen. Yeah, long as it's closed, especially in this weather, it'll be fine for tonight. Just leave it be until I come tomorrow, replied my friend Carl, who also happened to be a locksmith. I'll try to be at your place first thing in the morning. Early that day, the lock on my kitchen's glass sliding door broke, making it completely unusable. After being unable to fix the lock myself, I wound up calling Carl, all the while keeping an eye on the casserole I had put in the oven that was close to being ready. I was expecting my friend, Darren, and his girlfriend, Trisha, over for dinner. They celebrated Darren's 30th birthday the previous week, and I unfortunately was traveling for work. I figured this little home-cooked dinner was the least I could do for missing my friend's special day. I looked at the oven clock and saw it was 8.40. They were 40 minutes late. This was back in the 90s, when cell phones weren't mainstream like they were today, so I couldn't just text one of them to see why they were taking so long. Their tardiness actually wound up working out for two reasons. I was able to speak with Carl about the glass sliding door, and preparing the casserole took a lot longer than I expected. If Darren and Trisha arrived at 8 on the dot, dinner would have been way behind schedule. The biggest inconvenience about the glass sliding door's broken lock was my access to the storage shed, where I kept my wine, preservatives, and other non-perishable foods. The shed was literally a few steps outside from the kitchen. However, I now had to go through the front door, walk around the house, and into the backyard if I wanted something from the shed. Being midwinter, two days after the ground was coated with four to five inches of snow didn't make matters any easier. After hanging up with Carl, I saw there was still a few minutes left on the timer, and I realized I forgot to get a bottle from the shed. Darren and Trish weren't big wine drinkers anyway, and my refrigerator was stocked with their preferred beverages like soda and beer. But presentation was always important to me, and I always felt a bottle of wine was quintessential to the perfect dinner spread. I already made a few trips to the shed earlier this evening, when there was still a little light out, and soured at the thought of bundling up to make another, since it was now a lot colder and icier outside. Everything else was done, the table was set, side dishes and dessert were prepared, and the casserole would be ready any minute. It was ironic, I thought. I was so worried about not having everything done by 8 o'clock. Now I was concerned over whether the food would be cold by the time Darren and Trish arrived. I considered giving them a call, but decided to wait 20 more minutes. I went to the front door so I could turn on the outside lights. Flipping the switches, I nodded affirmingly when I saw the lights turn on from one of the windows and open the door to make sure the front pathway was properly illuminated. I gasped and almost stumbled back when I found Darren on my front porch, standing no less than an inch away from the doorway. He wore his dark grey sports jacket along with a green and black plaid shirt tucked into a pair of wrinkled beige khakis and black dress shoes. His brown hair was combed to the side and he looked noticeably pale, like all the colour was drained from his face. Darren wore this timid, awkward expression, his lips tightly pursed and green eyes appearing larger than they were by the lenses of his circular black frame glasses. Darren stood, completely straight, arms at his side, and was staring intently at the overhead light before redirecting his attention to me. Hello, Parker, Darren said in this robotic, monotonic voice a stark contrast to his typical vivacious persona. I am here, at your house, for dinner tonight. I raised an eyebrow at Darren's upright persona, unsure if something was amiss, or he was doing some kind of bit. I was getting worried about you guys, I replied, trying not to make it obvious I noticed something was off about him tonight. Where's Trish? Trish is still in the car. She needs help bringing something inside the house. It is a gift for you, Parker. Can you come outside to help Trish, my girlfriend? I grimaced when Darren, 
who started growing a little restless standing in place, asked me to step outside. I had no desire to throw on my two coats and snow boots, especially when the driveway was on the side of the house. I was about to reluctantly agree when I heard the oven's ding signifying the casserole was ready. Saved by the bell. Let me get the casserole out of the oven and cut it up first. Why don't you come in and warm up? I asked, gesturing for Darren to step inside. Darren's wide-eyed expression started showing some unease. He said nothing for a few seconds, before slowly poking his head inside the house and looking around, like a pet surveying the surroundings when entering their new home for the first time. Are you sure? Darren asked with some slight apprehension in his voice. I stared at him for a second or two, waiting for Darren to start cracking up. He didn't. Of course, Darren. What do you think I'm going to do? Make you eat dinner out in the freezing cold? I think you should come outside, Darren weakly replied. Come on. I put my arm on Darren's shoulder and ushered him inside, out of the cold. Help me with the casserole, it'll take two seconds. Darren tentatively let me guide him in, after which I shut the screen door and brought my friend into the kitchen. He looked very stiff and uncomfortable, taking shovel-like steps compared to my full strides. Darren kept looking at the ceiling and seemed unnerved or spooked by something as he ventured farther from the front door. I pulled out a chair from the kitchen table for Darren to sit in before opening the oven. The blast of heat felt quite nice after being subjected to the frigid, icy outside air. Using an oven mitt and dish towel, I took out the casserole and set the glass pan on top of the stove for it to cool. Turning back, Darren remained standing, completely upright, arms pressed firmly at his sides as he shifted between staring anxiously at me and gazing at the ceiling. I got the beer you like, so help yourself, I said, nodding at the refrigerator as I retrieved a knife to cut the casserole. I was about to start cutting the casserole, but realized I forgot to set the dishes on the table. You mind cutting the casserole? I asked Darren as I walked up to him and held out the kitchen knife for him to take. I just want to bring the sides to the table. After a few seconds, Darren slowly took the knife from me and looked at it wondrously, like this was the first time he ever saw one. I noticed beads of sweat were forming across Darren's forehead, and his hand, which I brushed against when handing him the knife, felt incredibly cold and clammy. What's the matter? I asked when Darren didn't say anything at first. And what took you guys so long to get here? Darren's lips remained sealed as he followed me to the stove. He stood motionless in front of the casserole, the hand holding the knife firmly pressed back against his side with the blade pointed towards the floor. I really think you should come outside, Darren said again, staring at the casserole and giving it a repulsed look like a child sitting before a plate of Brussels sprouts. I wasn't concerned yet, but was trying to figure out what was up with Darren. Maybe him and Trish had a fight? Did something happen before they came here? Was something on his mind? Trying to maintain a positive vibe, I smiled and lightly patted Darren on the back. Just cut up the casserole and let me bring these sides to the table. Then I'll help Trish outside, I said, while gesturing toward a bowl of mashed potatoes, another filled with peas, and a small tray of asparagus. Darren slowly turned his head and stared at the glass sliding door for a few seconds before turning back to me. You can get outside quickly through the kitchen door, then the front door, Darren said in a slightly encouraging tone. Locks broke, I replied as I tried figuring out how to hold all three sides when transporting them to the table. I wondered why Darren was so short-worded, yet so insistent on getting me to go outside with him. After setting the sides on the table, I returned to the kitchen. Darren remained standing over the stove, his entire face and hands dripping with sweat, and parts of his skin had a reddish-pink tint, vaguely resembling a sunburn. There were sweat marks under his arms and dark patches forming across his pants and shirt. He continued staring back and forth between the casserole and ceiling, looking like he was being extremely careful and precise with his head movements. 
He had this look of sickliness and trepidation across his face that was emphasized by his tense posture, appearing afraid to so much as nudge an inch from where he stood. Darren, what the hell's going on? I asked with visible concern as I hurried over to where he stood. You don't look good, like at all, dude. Darren's glossy, bloodshot eyes still widened, which were filled with panic-like terror and dismay now had greyish red circles forming around them, along with some slight swelling. Can we just go outside? Darren gasped, releasing his grip on the knife that made a high-pitched clang when it hit the floor. You don't look well, Darren. Let's sit you down and get you some water, I replied, putting my arm around his shoulder. Darren was so stiff, I had to actually yank him away before getting him to a seat. Just sit down, Darren. I'll go get Trish, I said, having to force him in a seated position on the chair. Although the expression on Darren's face didn't change, his eyes flared, indicating he was in some sort of excruciating pain or alarming state of mind. Soon as I sat Darren down and pushed his back against the chair, I heard a wet tearing sound come from his backside. I would have acknowledged it more, if my hands and forearms didn't get coated with sweat from touching him, and I was unnerved at how unusually tight and firm his skin felt. A trail of perspiration was smeared across the floor from the stove to Darren's seat, and continued seeping from his skin as it started to pool around the chair. He continued looking up at the ceiling, the worry and agony in his face intensifying. Just come outside with me, please. Darren yet again mumbled. I'm calling the paramedics first, I said, making sure Darren wasn't going anywhere before I rushed into the living room, which had the nearest phone. Just stay there, Darren. I'll go get Trish. I was about to reach for the phone when it rang. I froze at first, staring at the phone as the ringtone's rhythmic bleeps blared a second and third time before finally answering. Parker? I instantly recognized Carl's voice. Where are you right now? I'm home. I've got a situation right now though, Carl. I have to call 91. You haven't heard about Darren and Trish? Carl asked, cutting me off mid-sentence. A knot formed in my stomach while I took a slow breath before responding. What about them? I asked quietly so Darren wouldn't hear. I still get chills down my spine when I think of what Carl said. Parker, they're both dead. They were murdered earlier this evening. I said nothing at first, and slowly turned back towards the kitchen. Although I couldn't see Darren from where I stood, I knew he was physically here in my home. Carl, what are you talking about? They just got to my house a few minutes ago. I was literally staring at Darren in the face before you called. Carl was silent for a few seconds. I could hear him slowly breathing as he processed what I said. Parker, the police found their bodies like 30 minutes ago. I can see cop lights and hear the commotion outside the house from my bedroom window. I just got back from the house. It's all marked off by police. Is this one of your guys messed up jokes? I asked. What are you talking about? What sounded like a loud popping mixed with something metal striking a hard surface rang out from the kitchen accompanied with frantic scurrying footsteps that quickly faded. Carl kept talking, but his voice sounded muffled and disoriented, becoming more of a background noise as I slowly lowered the phone and started creeping towards the kitchen. Something kept me from calling out to Darren when I re-entered the kitchen. I gasped in shock at what I saw. The noise I heard was my glass sliding door, which was now wide open. The frigid winter night air poured into the kitchen and Darren was gone. The chair he'd been sitting in was turned over and his clothes were in a sopping wet pile on the table. It took me a few seconds to realize it, but thrown on top of the chair was a leathery light beige blanket. I was originally more bewildered than anything else as I tried to make sense of the scene before me. That confusion turned into sheer, unfettered, stomach-churning terror 
as I continued staring at the beige, leathery blanket thrown across the chair, quickly realizing it was an entire hide of human skin. It was then I noticed two footprints comprised of a cloudy bluish-gray ooze-like substance. They were narrow, with pointed heels and three elongated toes that individually varied in length. The same bluish-gray substance made two peculiar prints along the wall next to it, and on the glass sliding door, depicting a triangular-shaped hand with five stubby pointed appendages. My heart started racing frantically, and I nearly succumbed to panic, until I heard Carl's voice repeatedly call my name, which was when I realized the phone was still in my hand. Shakily putting it back to my ear, Carl kept asking if I was still on the line. I initially struggled to respond, while trying to comprehend everything, my limbs shaking uncontrollably and the knottiness in my stomach becoming so intense I was on the verge of vomiting. Carl? I barely managed to water, petrified to so much as move a muscle. What happened to Darren and Trish tonight? They're dead, Carl replied in a somber, yet visibly unsettled tone. A neighbor found them in the garage. Apparently, their bodies were completely skinned. I called the police soon after hanging up with Carl. The footprints led outside into the woods my backyard bordered. What disturbed me most was the police found a second set of identical footprints that originated from the side of my house next to the driveway. This other set of prints seemed to start from another full human skin hide, where police also found a bloated pair of scissors and three knives. It was quickly determined the skin hides were indeed those of Darren and Trish. They never discovered who or what killed Darren and Trish, but I have some disturbing theories. It's clear who or whatever came to my house that night wasn't Darren. Something was literally wearing his skin that night. Something that I led into my house with open arms, even handed a knife and turned my back to, thinking nothing of it at the time. I don't know what creature or being was in my house that night, but I don't think it could stay in fluorescent light or warm temperatures for a long time. That must explain why whatever posed as Darren was so stiff, sweated so profusely, and kept looking at the ceiling. Maybe they could only wear a skin hide for a certain amount of time before needing to make a switch. I don't know, and I don't like dwelling about it, even after all these years. I can't even fathom what would have happened to me if I initially listened to what I thought was Darren, and went outside with it that night. I was scrolling through my YouTube app, as I normally did before sleep, and stopped. There it was again. Shaded in an unnerving discolored green was the figure. Terrifying in nature, intentionally designed to scare. I closed the app immediately. This didn't mean resignation, but rather just a timeout. In the end, I always came crawling back to my phone, no matter what I saw but that livestream was the bane of my online existence. My parents used to tell me I spent too much time on the internet, a common thing for parents to say. To them, the hours spent was concerning, but compared to anyone else in my generation with a computer and phone, it's seen as relatively normal. I mean, if spending several hours a day online is seen as an addiction, then most of the world would be diagnosed with that. My personal vices were Reddit and YouTube. I'd subscribed to way too many channels and subreddits, and scrolling through them daily would be an endless void of new content to consume. After I'd rinsed through Reddit and caught up on the many subreddits I personally enjoyed, I'd switch over to YouTube for hours of fresh content. By the time I was finished there, Reddit was already brimming with new things to explore, and that doesn't even account for new subreddits that were constantly recommended or new YouTube channels that I was discovering on a near daily basis. 
my days became bloated with the consumption of pure online dopamine. However, in my repetitive grind of flicking my thumb up and up, looking for something new to binge, that damn livestream would inevitably pop up and sour my mood. When I wasn't on my phone, I'd be in my room, chilling on my PC, playing whatever game I felt like in that moment. The occasional tapping on my door, followed by voices, reminding me to eat or drink or bathe. An annoying pullback to reality, but a necessity that my parents always set up for me. It had been a few years since I'd left school. I finished just below average, with passable grades in most of the important classes. It's not that I wasn't smart. Far from it, in my opinion. I just never had something to drive me. I never grew up with a long-term career in mind, like others who wanted to be a pilot or a firefighter since childhood. And so, I just drifted in the currents of life, never making any strokes to pull myself out of the stream. Not that I didn't try when an opportunity arose. I invested the limited funds I had from government benefits into cryptocurrency when that was popping off. I even got my parents to pitch in. They were hesitant at first, but when they saw I was passionate about something, they pushed to see me strive towards something. Sadly, that bubble popped, and so did my parents' faith in me. So, that led me to where I was. Always just in my room, either playing a game, scrolling my phone, or doing the bare essentials to continue living. It wasn't much, but I was happy, living in my own little safe bubble. At around four in the morning, a little earlier than when I usually wound down for bed, I popped my headphones in and set some relaxing music to soothe myself to sleep. Music killed the silence. Silence, which brought about too many existential thoughts that I tirelessly worked so hard to push away. As long as I kept any thoughts I didn't like out of my head, I felt I was safe. Sadly, life had other plans for me. I felt myself wake but in an unfamiliar fashion. Though my eyes could move, my body could not. I'd never experienced this before, but I knew enough from the stories I'd read online to recognize that I was undergoing sleep paralysis. My eyes darted around, though I willed much more movement of my body. I knew what was to come, but was powerless to stop it. The only other sensation were the ominous soft murmurs in my ears from my headphones, a voice I didn't recognize, a far cry from the relaxing music I was listening to much earlier. Over the sounds of the sinister voice, and even through the earbuds, a new sound traveled across the room to me, a soft tapping that got louder and louder. It shot out from the closed door at the other end of the room, just within my field of vision. I thought the eerie sounds from the door were bad, but it was worse when they suddenly stopped, and all I could hear was the slow creaking of the door. Was this normal? I knew apparitions appeared during the hallucination period of sleep paralysis, but this didn't seem right at all. I felt myself calm, in beat with the room that now sat in silence. Nothing had moved in moments, and I took this time to try wiggle myself free from the paralysis. I stared at my exposed toes, willing them to move with all my mental might. However, the only sensation was a cooling breeze drafting over my foot from the now open door. After no progress, I blamed my lack of concentration on the annoying mutterings in my ears, ominous words that I tried my best to pay no mind to. I turned my sights to my right hand that was now peeking out of my covers. If my toes weren't willing to budge, Maybe something closer to my brain would cave in first. I strained and strained until I felt something, and my whole body fell numb. From the edge of the bed crept the most gnarled, twisted abomination of a hand I'd ever seen. It gently gripped my fingers with a light squeeze, and internally, all I could do was scream. At this point, things flipped, and my biggest fear now was to move. I was worried that if it picked up any movement from me, it'd react worse than I could. Yet, 
things got worse. My body felt a rush of warmth, and though I didn't want to confirm it, I suspected I could move again. A luxury I dared not relish in. The hand was still gently clasped on my fingers, and it took every morsel of willpower I had left to keep my hand from shaking. It wasn't soon enough before I felt the raisin skin fingers slide away and down the edge of the bed, but they wouldn't stay gone for long. I heard a faint shuffle at the foot of my bed, and it didn't stop as a silhouette slowly rose from the darkness. It went up and up, it leaned forward with a wide grin and planted one hand firmly on my bed and leaned just over my toes. I couldn't hold it in any longer. I yanked my feet back as fast as I could and curled up in the most defensive of fetal positions. Through the veil of tears, between the gaps in my fingers, I saw it plant its other hand down as it braced for a crawl. I panicked and threw the nearest thing at it. The pillow bounced softly off its shoulders. Undeterred, it moved one hand forward, its smile stretching wider, progressing its inevitable disjointed pace towards me. I grabbed my other pillow and threw it. I knew from prior experience it wouldn't do anything, but trying anything felt better than accepting fate. It seemed amused as its smile stretched even wider than what looked possible. Still, throughout all this, I couldn't help but build frustration at the annoying voice muttering through my earbuds. In my more immediate danger, I hadn't thought of removing them until then. I yanked out my buds, which stung my ears and ready myself to throw them, along with my phone at the figure, feeling like the hardened object may fare better than the featherfield kind. But, the strangest thing happened. The moment the earbuds were away from my ears, and the sound fizzled out, so did the figure. I sat there, bewildered, the static sounding whispers still buzzing through the wires clenched in my fist. I looked at the screen, and saw that YouTube's autoplay put on that wretched livestream I tried so hard to avoid. Since then, things have been different, but not necessarily in a bad way. That night created an aversion in me of letting autoplay dictate my video discoveries, but after growing tired of manually scrolling to search for content, I started ending my video watching sessions earlier. Soon, I found myself using my phone less in general, which also affected my mindless scrolling sessions on my PC. At first, the free time was killer, being left to stew my own turmoils, but I used this to really filter out my thoughts, let the questions of life I've been avoiding for so long ring out in my head, dig deep for some answers locked away in me. And you know what? I found some pretty serious issues, issues I took baby steps to solve. It wasn't easy by all means, there were times I fell, and was back in bed, scrolling brainlessly into the digital void. But I never fell fully back to who I was before, in the fear that I'd accidentally run into that damn stream again, and find myself in a worse danger than before. An event which I told people was just a trippy episode of sleep paralysis, but deep down I knew there was something off about it something actually dangerous. When things got particularly bad, and I felt my old life pulling me back by the ankles, I took to some extreme measures. I pulled up my YouTube homepage, knowing it wouldn't be hard to find, or rather let it find me, and bingo. Not two or three pulls of my scroll wheel did it pop up my recommended page. I screen grabbed the thumbnail, blew it up on Photoshop, printed it out on my old inkjet printer, and tacked it to the wall. It was crude, pixelated, bordering and looking like a real-life cursed image. But from where I often sat, it was easy to be reminded of that night I was trying so hard to run away from. A scar to warn me of the dangers of my unhealthy life. It was enough to remind me of the danger, without actually putting myself at risk. When people came over, I just told them I enjoyed niche online horror. Some people even recognized the YouTube channel which I personally knew nothing about. It's only been just over a year since then, but my life has turned around drastically. 
In place of my night browsing in bed, I now get a good night's sleep and wake up refreshed for the next day's activities. In place of gaming, I now have hobbies, a small job, and I've gotten into fitness. I even posted progress pictures on Reddit, which they loved. In place of the cold online chat rooms, I went out and met some local people. Though I did cheat and met them from an online tabletop forum. But because we do meet for weekly D&D sessions and other fun meetups, to me, it counts. I only slept once during that time. A night after a bit of drinking with my new friends. I felt almost nostalgic. The clawing of old habits pulling me by my weakened resolve after a few units of alcohol. I re-downloaded my Reddit app and caught up on a few subreddits I used to love. And when the lulls of sleep called me, I felt like soothing myself to some meditating tunes. I tried Spotify instead, hoping that the escape from YouTube might have been the answer I'd missed so long ago. But that was not the case. Just as I was on the cusp of sleeping, about to visit the land of Nod, a voice came on. A vibe much harsher and sinister than the songs I was just getting accustomed to. I quickly pulled out my headphones and powered off my device just to be sure. The sudden burst of panic sobering me up quickly and left me pumped with enough adrenaline to not sleep for the rest of the night. Frankly, it was a small price to pay for the dangers of what might have happened. Other than that, my life has gotten so much better. Everyone around me thinks I took to fighting my old lifestyle, that I just had a wake-up call and turned my life around through my own hard work. But the truth is, I did all this out of fear. The church at the edge of town seemed empty, as it usually was, which is why she and I found ourselves in the back of the building, sitting at the top of its high concrete staircase. We needed to come apart, away from everyone else, and as I sat there, 17 years old and full of heartache, it honestly felt like my entire world was crashing down around me. Even though we did our best to disappear into the early night hours, there was a bright light raining down at us from above the church's back door, like a spotlight on our pain. As we sat there, we did our best to ignore the exposure. Did you really sleep with him? I asked her, for what might have been the hundredth time. Waiting for her familiar answer, I continued to look out across the open field behind the church. The field was wide and long, much larger than a football field perhaps even larger as a couple of them. It marked the outskirts of my little town, ending with a tree line in the distance. As I peered out over the empty field, it wasn't hard to imagine that she and I were the last two people remaining in the entire world. What a depressing idea. Yes, she finally answered after several seconds of silence. Even though I already knew the answer, Having heard it a hundred times before, I still held out a sliver of empty hope that her response would suddenly change. All she had to do was tell me no. One simple no would erase a hundred yeses, and sadly, I would happily believe her. I would erase those yeses from memory and never think of them again. Anything for us to go back to the way we were, before her cousin had unexpectedly called my home, before knowing about him. But the answer, along with reality, would not change. A real yes would never become a fake no. At least not for me. What do we do now? I asked, my eyes feeling the threatening burn of oncoming tears. I both heard and felt a puff out of breath of frustrated air. I wanted to look over and see her face, see her expressions, knowing that she was feeling the same type of way that I was. But at the same time, I couldn't bear it. So I continued to keep my sight on the dark field and the calm emptiness of it, which was the opposite of my full, chaotic brain. Suddenly, she sprung to her feet. Startled, I cringed away from her unexpected movements, as if jolted from sleep. 
I had to finally look at her. Her slender body and beautiful face, her caramel colored skin, my love, my loss. Deep inside, I ached for her, an ache that resonated from my core. I did my best to bury that ache as I watched her move to the back door of the church. Turning back to me, she replied, Let's ask God. As she placed her hand on the door's knob, my eyes darted to the church's gravel lot. I knew the building was unoccupied, but for some reason, I still had to visually make sure that there were no cars. I could see the back half of the lot, but it was obviously empty, like I knew it would be, as it usually was. Compared to the other handful of churches that I found along that particular stretch of road, a road I often referred to as Saint's Row, that church was an oddity. It was an oddity because, having lived in the same town my whole life, I never personally know I have never personally known anyone who attended it. Yet, I knew that there had to be at least a few people who entered this church because occasionally I would notice a handful of parked cars in the gravel lot. But unlike those who went to other churches, which normally met on Sunday mornings and sometimes Wednesday evenings outside of their special functions, there didn't appear to be any rhyme or reason for when the people of that particular church, whomever they may be, came together to worship. If this door is unlocked, she said, returning my attention to the cruel reality. It means that God wants us to come inside. There was no way the door would be unlocked. No way. There were two small windows, one on each side of the door, but there were stained glass, strange, abstract and obscure shapes in multiple vibrant colours, making it impossible for me to properly see through them. The only thing that I could make out through the colours of the stained glass was a subtle light coming from a dim source somewhere inside the building. I couldn't tell if there was anyone inside moving around or moving past the windows, but I didn't believe so. From all appearances, it seemed like no one was home. That meant that the door should be locked. I mean, there was no way that the priest or pastor or whoever would leave the building without locking up behind them, not in a small town like ours. Yet, as I was getting ready to tell her this fact, she turned the knob. It turned, without resistance or restraint. I tried to plead. I wanted to tell her to stop. No, don't go in there. Before I could say anything out loud, she had the door pushed open before disappearing inside. Either by her hand or the force of physics, the door returned closed. My heart pounded in my ears as my pulse began to race. I was suddenly terrified. We should not be doing this. This is wrong. My mouth became so dry that my tongue started to hurt. We should not be doing this. What if it was actually God's will? Whether it be my God or whatever God those of that church worshipped. What if she had been right and the door being unlocked was, in all reality, a signal for us to come inside? A strange, animal-like scream suddenly erupted behind me. Startled, my bones nearly jumped through my skin. Twisting around, my eyes fell on a broad concrete base, the tiny slab illuminated by the light above the church door. Planted deeply into the grass and earth of a large field, the rock base sat several yards from the empty gravel lot. My eyes began on the base before swiftly running upward along the narrow stone pillar that the base held, tracking the source of the scream. At the top of the pillar, nearly two stories up, there was a statue of a man wearing a grey robe. That statue always creeps me out. Whenever I would happen to pass by that church, for whatever reason, it always felt as if the statue man was staring at me, his eyes following me, even though his face was completely concealed behind an upturned hood. It always gave me the chills, as if the eyes were directly on me, following me. Did the statue man even have eyes? Did whoever made him feel the need to add them? Or was he faceless under that hood? The statue man, whether he was supposed to be a monk, or a pilgrim, or a wise man of Jesus, had his left arm outstretched wide in the motion of a coming embrace. Yet, the embrace was only half formed, because the statue man did not have a right arm. 
When I had first noticed the missing arm, I had assumed weathering and age had caused the piece of stone to merely fall off. Yet, looking closer, I wasn't so sure. The right arm was indeed missing. However, the grey robe had a right sleeve hanging limply at the statue's side. An empty sleeve in which the right arm would fill. At that moment, it seemed to me that there never was a right arm. Strange. Another animal-like screech rang out. Perched on the statue man's only arm was a large, dark-feathered vulture. Like the statue man, the large corpse eater was also staring intensely down at me. After adjusting his footing on the arm, the vulture opened its mouth wide and gave another eerie scream, which sounded like a mixture of a crying woman and a shrill wind blowing. Trying to shake off the creepy feeling the statue man and the vulture gave me, I return my attention to the church door. I should leave, shouldn't I? When I didn't follow her, she would get the point and just come back out, won't she? She was trying to play a stupid game and I should not indulge her, right? Right, I should go home. I didn't though. I didn't go home. Instead, I followed her into the church. Once inside, I was immediately greeted by a wall of thick, hot air that nearly stole my breath away. It was stale and heavy and took me by surprise. While the air outside had been that of a cool spring night, the air inside was like hell itself. It was a little hard to breathe at first and I had to pause to adjust. Heavy sweat erupted from my pores. As I paused to gather my bearings, I noticed that I was now standing in a cramped foyer which opened into a wide but short hallway. Along the hall, there were three open doorways. I could clearly see them against the yellow light that was brightly spilling from the nearest doorway and into the hall. The yellow light rolled down the short hall and into the foyer, causing me to believe that it was the same light that I'd seen tapping against the vibrant colors of the stained glass window. I did not see her though. I listened closely for her, but all I could hear was my own heart beating against my ribs. Slowly, I began to step through the foyer before further moving into the hall. I tried to walk quietly so that I can listen for any signs of her, but the floorboards below my dingy, brown carpet groaned and squeaked beneath my shifting weight. I crept up on the first open doorway, the only door on the right side of the hall. Cautiously, I peeked through. I still did not find her, as I'd been hoping. Instead, I looked into what appeared to be a normal, small office space with the usual desk, chair, bookcase, and metal filing cabinet often found in one. The source of the yellow light was a bare, burning bulb that hung from the ceiling. Had someone forgotten to turn the bulb off, or did they leave it burning on purpose? It didn't matter. I had to keep moving so that I could find her and get the hell out of there before the person who possibly left the light burning returned to fix their mistake. Continuing along the hall, I arrived at the second of the three doors. Beneath the shadow that fell through the open doorway, I could easily make out a simple bathroom with a single toilet and a single sink. Empty. She was not in there either. Arriving at the last doorway, I once again found a simple room, a kitchen. Aside from its long stove and multiple fridges and freezers, it was also empty. She was not there either. Damn it. The game was getting annoying and I was growing frustrated. I did not want to play hide and seek in some weird church. I was tempted to yell for her, for her to stop hiding, for her to show herself. Rather than filling the church with my booming voice, I chose to continue quietly moving, tiptoeing around the final stretch of the hall. The hall eventually opened up into a large room, a sanctuary. Even though the office light had failed to fully reach into the room, I luckily had another light source by which to see. Several, in fact. Tiny orbs of light, to be more accurate, which were being emitted from the tips of white, electric candles that were scattered along the room's four halls. The tiny dots of light showed me a sanctuary that was more than merely large, but massive. 
It was a giant square room with high ceilings and a hardwood floor. The whole floor had been stained and varnished a glossy red, a contrast to the dingy brown carpet found back in the hall and the other rooms. Filling the majority of the new room space were long wooden pews, which are also a glossy red. It was easy to assume, like most common churches, that the sanctuary was the center of the building, the heart of the church. On the room's far right wall, I could make out a set of double doors that must be the front entrance to the building. Unlike the seemingly cheap back door, the set of front doors appeared to be built thick and sturdy, while also stained and varnished to match the floor and pews. As I scanned the sanctuary further, I couldn't help but notice that there was a total lack of the usual religious decorations. No hanging crosses, or tortured messiah, or paintings that depicted paradise or fluttering angels. There wasn't anything like that, at all, which seemed odd and unusual to me. Instead, there were only rows and rows of pews facing toward a slightly raised wooden stage, also stained and varnished like everything else. And, at the head of the stage, there was only a single wooden podium. My eyes began to dart around the massive room until they eventually stopped on the third row of pews. On her. She was sitting there, motionless. Her face pointed in the direction of the stage and podium. From my distance, in the hallway entrance, I tried to see a mood, to read her expression. But the light of the candles threw shadows across her face, concealing any revelations I might find. Had she noticed me? Why wasn't she looking my way? Why was she still playing games? After what she did to me, I should be the one playing the games. Not her. Not her. Her head remained unturned as I walked over. There was just enough empty space between herself and the end of the pew for me to sit down at her side, as if she never doubted for a minute that I would chase her into an empty, shadowy church. She never doubted for a second, and she'd been simply sitting there, waiting for me to catch up. Several seconds of silence passed between us, both of her eyes drawn to the empty stage. Finally, she spoke. What do you think God is saying to us? Such a strange question. I don't hear him, I replied, then added, or her. Well, she continued, before finally turning to look my way. I hate him. Why would he do this to us? God did this? I responded, my voice rising, filling with venom. I turned and found a gaze among the shadows. She didn't answer, but through the shadows, I could vaguely make out some weird energy that was dancing behind her eyes. No, I continued. You did this. You were the one who slept with some guy you just met, some stranger and your cousin's apartment. You, not God. You, and you alone. You are the one who tore my heart out and stomped on it. For what? I need to know. God doesn't need to talk to me, but you do. Why did you do it? Why? You tore my world apart. Why? I heard her stifle back what sounded like the beginnings of a sob or a burst of tears. Without saying another word, she raised and scrambled away, swiftly moving down the row of pews and out of the other side. She ran in the opposite direction of the back hallway, while also moving away from the set of front doors. Where the hell was she going? I hadn't noticed the set of stairs until I realized that she was running directly for them. At once, I leapt from my seat. Back on my feet, I dashed for her and these newly discovered steps, but I had no chance of getting to her before she reached them. Down she went, and out of sight. Her basement? Perfect. The game continues. As I reached the top of the stairs, I paused to peer down into the dark abyss. None of the small orbs of lights behind me seemed strong enough to pierce the deep black of the basement. Suddenly remembering my cell phone, I pulled it from my pants pocket. After giving the screen several taps, I was able to turn on its flashlight. Using the newly emitted beam of light, I began to descend the stairs, their red-stained boards creaking and groaning. 
My throat tightened as I moved from one step to the next. It almost felt like plunging into a large body of dark, open water, unsure of what dangers I might encounter once I broke through the surface. At the bottom of the steps, I discovered an area much smaller than I'd anticipated. The basement obviously did not run the full extent of the church. Instead, the area below wasn't even half the size of the area above. I threw the phone's beam of light against the nearest corner of the basement, before slowly following along the concrete walls and concrete floors as I attempted to take in everything the light revealed. The area was sparsely furnished. There were two tables. The main table, which appeared to be constructed using several pale fallen tables positioned end to end, sat at the center of the basement. It ran quite long and cut the room down the middle. Lining the main table were at least 30 plastic chairs. To the left of the table were three other similar foldable chairs, but much shorter, most likely to be used by children. Tucked into the side of the shorter tables were close to a dozen or so plastic chairs, also small in size. How many people went to this church? A couple of feet from there, and facing toward the kids' table, there was what I immediately observed to be a white, dry erase board held by a black tripod. Standing directly in front of the whiteboard, almost nose to nose with it, I found her. She was like a statue, standing still and intensely staring at the whiteboard. As my light fell over her, I nearly cried out at a sudden appearance from the dark. Hastily, I marched over. Like before in the sanctuary, she never turned to me or seemed to notice my arrival. It was like she was in a trance or something. The hairs on my arms stood up and a shiver rushed down my spine. For several seconds, I simply stared at the side of her face, which looked ghostly in the phone's bright beam of light. Before I could say a word to her, I noticed that she had a black marker in her hand. Two lines had been written across the center of the whiteboard. The first line, written in what I knew well to be her handwriting. God is not here for me. More games. I had once told myself. She was being a drama queen, and I have had just about enough of it. But then I saw the second line, also in black, but written in handwriting I did not recognize. No, but we are. What the hell? Who else was down here? I didn't get a chance to ask her, or better search the basement for another person, because the sound of shuffling feet was unexpectedly heard moving above us, or at least that's what it seemed like to me. It was faint, but I was almost sure I had heard it. At once, I snuffed out the light. After throwing a blanket of darkness over the both of us, I returned the cell to my pocket. Unconsciously, I held my breath, and then listened. More faint shuffling. Maybe. Someone walking? pastor or priest? More than one person? I couldn't be sure. Void of light to guide my way, I somehow found a hand with mine. I squeezed it tight, forcing her to drop the black marker to the concrete. We needed to get out of here somehow. We should just make a run for it, right? But I didn't move, and neither did she. For a minute? Ten minutes? I can't be sure how long we waited and listened for any more signs of movement coming from above us. All I know is that at some point, I concluded that the shuffling sounds had either been in my imagination or whoever had been moving around was gone. Either way, I began to slide toward the bottom of the steps, toward the only source of faint light, pulling her along behind me like a zombie. I paused briefly, listening again. Nothing. After finally releasing my held breath, I began to ascend the stairs toward the room of worship. I tried to tread lightly, to keep the groaning of the wood to a minimum, but every step seemed like an axe splitting a log in two, fully announcing our presence. If one or more people were within earshot of the stairs, it was hard to believe they would not be aware of us, yet we still tiptoed the rest of the way to the top. I didn't want to turn my head unless we were all the way to the top and exposed, 
because I wanted to prolong our fate for as long as I could. Thinking back, I should have never stopped to look. I should have shielded my eyes or closed them altogether. I should have immediately and blindly rushed the front door, the closest exit, her hand still gripped in mine. Would I have made it? I can't be sure. But that wouldn't have been the point. Because I would make it either way. But if I would have rushed to the front door as soon as we got to the top of the stairs, I might not have lost her. I didn't though. I paused and looked. I took a stumble back, unbalanced by what I was looking at. The red stained pews were no longer empty. They were nearly full, filled with the living and the dead, all of them motionless and staring forward. I looked upon the sides of the many faces, men and women. Some appeared young, others seemed older. Some were pink and healthy looking, while others were covered in rotting, peeling flesh. And then, scattered among the healthy and rotting faces, were the shadows. They were not tricks of light cast by electric candles. They were something else. As odd as it might seem, somewhere in the back of my mind, I already knew what they were. They were the black remnants of people that were so long dead from the world that their physical vessels had become dust and dirt. The smell. Oh God, that smell. I retched when the stench of death struck me, like a thick cloud of sewage and despair. For whatever reason, I still did not run. Why hadn't I run right then? Instead, I swallowed and followed the gaze, the living and the dead, to the stage, to the podium. Standing at the podium, his single arm stretched out wide, was the statue from atop the pillar. Somehow, he had gotten down. His robe was no longer made of concrete, no longer grey, but instead, it was a brilliant crimson cloth, like the colour of blood as it spouts from its freshly opened wound. I still did not know if a face existed within the black of its upturned hood, but at that moment, there was no doubt that the statue man was looking directly at me. At us. That was when I finally ran. I dashed full speed along the end of the pews and toward the front set of doors. I made it over halfway to the exit before I lost a hand. One minute I was still squeezing it tight, and the next minute there wasn't anything for me to grip. Skidding to an abrupt stop, I looked behind to where she had been a second before. She was gone. As if on instinct, I began to desperately scan the pews, rubbing my eyes back and forth along the mass of bodies still sitting there. All of them had continued to face blankly ahead to the statue man. All of them, except one. Her. She was sitting again in the pews, at the end of the same row as before, except instead of peering blankly forward to the crimson man, she was looking to me for help, pain and guilt in her eyes, calling to me without words. I want to say that I went for her, that I rescued her and we made it out safely, but that would be a lie. For the sake of honesty and truth, I ran away and left her there. I didn't even pause to glance back as I escaped the church. I couldn't take seeing her pleading face, her cheating face. Once I was clear of the church and at the side of Saints Row, I paused only for a second or two. From my position, I could see along the side of the building and across its gravel lot, where space had previously been empty, sat cars and other vehicles. Promptly looking away, I pointed myself down the road. I didn't want to see the full lot or what was planted in the field beyond it. I turned my eyes before they could fall upon the tall stone pillar and the emptiness I knew I would find at its peak. I have a job that I think most people don't consider to be too hard but there's a knack to it, the sort of catch that can make it very stressful. I write horror stories, and I believe that, at its core, 
horror is about exploration. I have to take you to see places and things no one has ever seen before, which is hard because everything in my head is a product of a life I've spent living in the same world as you. So I have to make sure that you see enough to get a fright, but never quite glimpse enough of it to break the illusion. But how can anything be unknown when I've had to know it in order to write it? That's the catch. That's the paradox. I have to take a great torch and shine it under a rock and say, come look everyone, I found some shadows. But of course, the light makes the shadows go away. Did you know you have a blind spot? We all do. It's where the optic nerve interferes with the light sensitive nerves in your retina, creating a small spot in your vision where you can't see anything at all. It's just I say this because I think somebody's playing a joke on me. I've spent so long looking for darkness so that I can drag it into the light and show it off. But I'm not sure how I can do that. It first came to my attention at the optometrist. I'd been getting headaches over the last year and I thought that perhaps my prescription needed updating. So I went for my usual checkup, explaining my symptoms and then playing a little game of which lens makes the world more or less fuzzy. Soon after, I had an irritating burst of air puffed into my eye and then the optometrist asked me to sit down and look at a strange machine that, I knew from memory, would show me a photo of a hot air balloon. Focus on the balloon, the optometrist said, and I did. And... Click. A photo was taken. A moment passed. I leaned back and stretched my shoulders. The optometrist walked over to a glowing screen in the corner of the room where he stood with his back to me, his body hunched over. In the oppressive silence that followed, I heard and felt a faint scratching around my ears and behind my eyes, but attributed it to a discomfort from sitting in the dark for so long. I need to take a closer look, the optometrist said, his voice wavering. I sat back in the chair and patiently waited as he spread my eyelids with latex fingers and loomed towards me with a bright light, his face an obscure shape in the darkness. Look to the left, please, he said, which I did, politely enduring the discomfort. And to the... I preempted his instructions and looked to the right. I wanted this to be over, quickly. But the moment stretched on, the hands of his watch ticking audibly close to my ear. Somewhere, a beat had been missed. The optometrist said nothing. He didn't even move. And then, he started screaming. He threw himself backwards and let loose a shrill cry of unbridled terror that rose up and out of his chest like a concerto violin. I stood up immediately, stuttering and stammering, trying to think of what to say while the chair behind me spun in the darkness. I took a step forward and he lunged away, diving to the floor and grabbing nearby tables and wrenching them to the ground, sending strange lights and metal instruments clattering against the tiles. He was trying to get away, I realised, noticing how he scrambled across the floor like a frightened dog, crawling towards the nearest wall where he slowly pulled himself up to a standing position and stood facing away from me. Doctor? I asked. He flicked his head around, saw me, and started screaming again, pressing himself harder against the wall like he was trying to will himself through solid stone. Doctor? I asked again. The features of his face had been twisted into strange proportions by sheer terror. His wide, bulging eyes glanced around before he reached for a nearby pair of the scissors. I didn't even have time to utter another word. He thrust the pointed edge into his neck, just below the jaw, and dragged the blade along his throat in a jagged, zigzag pattern. Blood flowed freely down his chest, soaking his lab coat black in the electric glow of the nearby computer. From his mouth, the blood flowed fruitfully, dribbling down his chin in oily black currents. After a minute or so, he went pale. Life left his face to a chorus of hissing bubbles and timid gurgles. He fell first onto his knees, squirting arterial jets all over my shoes and then onto my face, his limp body bringing more aluminium tables clattering to the ground. From behind me, 
lights were switched on, and an array of cries and yells and grief-wrecked sobs filled the open doorway. I told the police exactly what had happened, and while I'm certain they suspected me of foul play, there was, thankfully, a security tape that cleared my name before I'd even left the building. Nonetheless, I was asked not to leave town by a stern-looking woman who questioned me as I sat perched on one of the ambulances that had parked all over the curb, along with the police and press. After that, she left me alone with a brief look of sympathy and confusion. In the moments that followed, I noticed a gathering of men in white lab coats and paramedics amidst the crowd, all speaking in confused, hushed tones. Surreptitiously, I watched them passing around a familiar, grainy printout. This is the photo. This is from his last patient, one of them asked. Another looked as if they were about to reply when the photo came their way and, focusing upon it, they suddenly began to dry heave. I didn't feel like being treated as some kind of specimen, so I stood, trying to be as inconspicuous as I could, and began to make my way through the crowd. However, I didn't get far when, from behind, I heard someone cry out. Excuse me, sir, they said, some part of me hoping to God they meant another sir. Mr. Riddle, Mr. Riddle, Mr. Riddle, sir, Mr. Riddle, they cried, and I increased my pace to a brisk walk. Luckily, there was nearly a hundred people on that small pavement, and I ducked my head down and carried on until, a few seconds later, my pursuer cried out, I can't see him, he's gone. I breathed a sigh of relief and hurried home, where I uncontrollably paced between various mirrors for the rest of the night. I spent hours holding my eyelids open and rolling my eyes in their sockets, but all I saw were grey and foggy irises, the colour of a polluted and rainy sky at four o'clock. My sclera were pockmarked and faintly yellowish in places, and even the spidery veins that crawled across the glassy surface had taken on an unhealthy bluish sheen. They looked thick and sore, like the roots of a tree burrowing through soil, and that scratching sound had followed me home, making it harder and harder to focus on the problem at hand until, eventually, I collapsed from fatigue on my sofa. The next day, I woke up to a hammering on the door and opened it to find a haggard-looking man in white overalls. Mr. Riddle? he asked. Yes, I answered, putting a firm hand on the edge of the door, just in case. I'm Dr. Sutton. I'm, uh, I work at a nearby research facility and, um, or was, a colleague of Dr. Millow, who you saw yesterday. Oh, right, I said. I told everyone what there was to know. I, um, I know. Can I come in? He asked hurriedly, moving as if to enter. I leaned forward and barred him, reflexively at first, and then a little more deliberately. But when he looked at me, it was with pleading eyes, like he was a death row inmate looking for appeal. Looking at him then, I felt that he deserved pity more than suspicion, and I stood aside. Come in, I said, and he promptly did. Oh my, he said, stopping for a moment to look at my personal effects all laid out. I watched a strange train of thoughts tarry through his head before he eventually turned to me and asked, What are you? I'm a horror writer, I replied. He looked back around the room, taking it all in once more. It's research, I said, answering his question before he'd spoken it out loud. It's just stuff to try and make everything a bit more authentic. Folklore, myths, things like that. But, I'm just a writer, I said with a shrug. A struggling one, but I do try. I don't understand, he said. It's just, we spent all night going over the photo. How can you be normal? There's already been two suicides, probably more. One of my students shredded the only physical copy and smashed my laptop to bits and it was the most sensible thing anyone in that conference room did all night. Are you saying that what's in that photo is the reason that all that stuff from yesterday happened? I think you know that, he said, looking at me with just a hint of aversion. I've seen the tapes, and looking at you now, 
I can only assume you're smart enough to put two and two together. But yes, that's exactly what happened. And it didn't just stop there either, Mr. Rittle. That photo is... It means terrible things for all of us. And it's just not stopped taking lives. But the thing is, and this is what I'm struggling to understand, that thing is a picture of what's inside you. Can I see it? I asked. The photo? No, he replied. I don't think that would be a very good idea at all. There is a digital copy, but... No, I'm sorry, but no. Can you at least describe it to me? No, he snapped. Absolutely not. I can still feel it in the air, in my skin. I can taste it. I wouldn't describe it to you, even if I could. So, why are you here? I asked. Because that thing is inside you, he cried. We need to... I don't even know. I think I'm the only one who's seen it, who has enough sense to even think about what we need to do next, as a society, as a species. Carefully, I took a step backwards. I need to see it, he said. It's the only way to know anything more about it. Until then, we've just got pixels, and as far as this thing is concerned, that's about as good as words. You can see the computer struggling to process it. A JPEG is... It's like a blurry reflection of a reflection. I hate to say it, but I really do need to see it. Another examination, I said. Yes. If you show me the digital copy, then I'll agree to an examination. I could see the desperation in his face as he accepted my terms. And about half an hour later, after I'd showered and dressed, we both left in my car for his office. He had, bizarrely, left his behind after walking the 14 miles to my apartment at 2am. Were all those things really research? He asked as he led me through the open doors of a small office building where he worked. Where is everyone? I asked. Probably gone home, he replied. After Professor Garrett mass emailed the photo to everyone in a state of religious hysteria, I imagine most of them are either at home recovering or, well, we were passing a glass office door and Dr. Sutton turned and faced it, directing my attention to a pale man lying on the table, his eyes torn out and his ribcage cracked open. The doctor turned and gave me a pained look before leading me on. After that, Lana shredded it, wiped the servers and destroyed every publicly available copy that she could. That was a very smart and kind thing of her to do. Probably the most important thing she or anyone else in this building has ever done. And he never answered my question. Was all of that stuff really just research? Yes, I said. Do you really think I'm some kind of devil worshipper? I didn't see his face anywhere in those books or in those glass jars. But there were others. They're just things, I answered icily. I have to break things up to rearrange them to make new unknown and frightening things. The more authentic the building blocks, the better the end product. So I start with folklore and mythology. Old, new, obscure, common. I bring it all together in the hope that I can make something new with all the parts. It would just be a heavy dose of irony, he said, for all of this to happen to a horror writer. That's not irony, I said. It'd be irony if it happened to a children's author or a true crime writer. My job is to seek these things out, to show them off and try and make a quick buck. But you can't see it, can you? He asked, a dark, mirthless smirk spreading across his face. Out of everyone alive, you'll never get to bring it into the light. So I think that is irony, actually, Mr. Riddle. He stopped and gestured to an open door. This way, please. Unlike before, most of the procedure of an eye test was left behind. Instead, we went straight to an examination, with a doctor switching off the lights and hesitantly opening my eyelids as he leaned forward. I waited anxiously as he leered into my eye with breathy clumsiness until a peculiar stillness came over him. For some reason, in that silence, the scratching of my head was almost deafening. 
and as soon as he released his grip and turned away, I cringed from the pain, soothing my head with cold hands. In less than a second, I was overcome with an intense need to fall on my knees, somehow communicated to me through the deafening hiss of my migraine. I pushed myself out of my chair with my eyes screwed shut, feeling something cold and harsh slash my cheek as I collapsed. As soon as my knees touched the floor, the pain left me, and I opened my eyes to see Dr. Sutton standing there with a bloodied scalpel clutched in his fist. Touching my cheek, I realized he must have attacked me, narrowly missing my eye as I fell. I'm doing you a favor, he said, before lunging towards me with a terrifying glee. It has to be excised, he cried out, his frantic attack sending me scrambling backwards. I tried to crab crawl away, but it was useless in the dark, and the doctor, who towered over me with a blinding light, closed the distance easily. If you could see it, he said, getting ready to attack once more, you'd be begging for this. Wait, I cried out. Okay, okay, I get it, I understand. Just let me sit up. You can't do it in the dark. Please, take a moment. Think clearly. The doctor hesitated, his face pained, before leaning down to reach out to me. Expecting the worst, I closed my eyes and cried out in terror when I felt his hand on my shoulder. But a moment later, he was pulling me up. He didn't speak, but once I stood up, he leaned against me and began to cry. Gradually, he went limp until he would have slid to the floor without my support, quietly crying in my arms. After a prolonged silence, he looked up at me with bloody and teary eyes and looked as if he was about to speak. Scared for my life, I took it as a sign of his distraction and seized the moment, shoving him with all my strength. I didn't have much of a plan at this stage, aside from fleeing, but thankfully the doctor slipped as he scrambled to stay on his feet and stuck his head on a nearby counter. When he slumped to the ground, streaking blood down the side of the cabinet doors, I waited for a second to see if he'd move. When he didn't, I let out a breath I didn't even know I was holding, and then took a moment to collect myself. It was hard getting him out of there. I'm not a strong man, but luckily there was no one around to see me. Despite the fact, I managed to wheel him out of the building, hastily propped up in a desk chair. It was still a tense and nervous experience. The clinical halls of the research facility were painted in anxiety-inducing pastels, and the sterile, echoey office space gave off the sense that someone nearby was watching me. The stale air hummed menacingly with the sound of distant AC fans and running computers, and as I struggled down the long corridors, I caught sight of even more strange corpses. One was hanging from an overhead pipe, another had shattered the side of their skull with a hammer they still held loosely in their pale hand, and one had somehow drowned themselves in a hand-washing station. Another one I saw had somehow swallowed their own fist up to the forearm and fallen to their knees where they remained frozen, eyes bulging, their throat distended, and their skin partially flayed by their own desperate effort to commit suicide. They looked like some kind of pilgrim on worship. I stared at them, panting to catch my breath, but was startled when their head slowly turned in my direction. So close to the exit. I simply looked away and sprinted the last few meters out of the door where my car awaited. I quickly bungled the doctor into the back seat and drove away as quickly as I could. I did momentarily consider taking the doctor to the hospital, but a few minutes into the drive, he groaned and shifted his head. While he remained passed out for the duration of the drive, I was still confident he would be okay. Well, relatively okay. When he awoke that evening, he was understandably a little confused to find himself back in my home. Before leaving the research facility, I had taken the opportunity to grab a laptop I'd assumed was his and hoped to high heaven that it might contain the photo I was looking for. My intention was to get the password out of him before letting him go, but given his state of mind, some precautions for my own safety had to be taken. When he awoke, I expected he might be confused as to why he was handcuffed to a radiator. But strangely, he did no such thing. 
He merely looked at me, started to cry, and then laid back down on the ground and stared at the ceiling. Nothing I said could elicit a verbal response from him. I pleaded with him for a password, for a hint, for anything. I even held my eyelids open and moved towards him, as if I could somehow leverage his fear of my eye to get a response. But it was like he was a gibbering wreck, quivering in the corner like an abused dog. The only time he spoke was right at the very end. Having pulled up a chair to sit opposite him, I had spent hours speaking my thoughts aloud, until eventually I struck a nerve. I think I could figure out that little machine, I said, and his eyes widened. It's hooked up to a desktop. What do you need to do? Turn it on? Mess with some software? Come to think of it, the one in your office had the software still open, didn't it? I bet it's not too hard to figure out. No, he stammered. And for the first time I realized that his difficulty speaking might not be from brain injury or stubbornness, but rather a glance at his tongue showed a strange, cracked bluish color, swollen and filling his mouth so that when he did open it, yellowing drool ran down his chin. I could take a photo and put it on the internet, or you could just tell me where to find the original and then I'll delete it. It's just this thing, it's inside me. Don't I have a right to see it myself? No, he whined, more yellow colored froth running from his misshapen mouth. Fine then, I hissed. I'm going back to the lab. Wait, he cried, reaching out and grabbing my trousers. Quivering, he pointed to his mouth. Kill me, he hissed. It hurts. Please, no one has gone this long. It's not right. I gave it a moment's thought. No, I said. Not until I have the photo. I expected him to wail in defiance, but he didn't. Instead, he slumped back down like a terminally ill patient and stared up at the ceiling. Standing just out of his line of sight, I watched him for a quiet moment, noticing how oddly swollen his throat was and how strange the blood was that clotted around his head wound. It shimmered in the dark, and just for a moment, it felt like looking into a starry sky. I quickly looked away, ignoring the sound of buzzing flies that filled my ears, and left. I drove quickly, and not as safely as I ought to have, coming afoul of a cop not too far from my destination. I cursed myself as I pulled over, reeling from the anxiety-inducing scratch that had begun to blare as soon as I decided to stop the car. By the time the policeman was knocking on my window, I was clutching my head like I was about to explode and it took every ounce of my willpower to roll the window down. Officer, I said, trying to smile while ignoring the taste of blood in my mouth. Is there anything I can help you with? I turned to stare at them, hoping I didn't look as bad as I felt. For a moment, the policeman looked down at me with the expression of a disappointed teacher, a breathalyzer held in his hand. In less than a second, his eyes flicked over my face and my clothes, and the look on his face was replaced with a concern. Sir, he said, I'm going to need you to... And just like that, he made eye contact. True, proper, eye-to-eye -eye contact for the first time. Now, the expression on his face was anything but that of a teacher. Now, it was that of a student in trouble. Or even worse, a toddler coming to terms with the death of their mother. It was awful. It racked the heart just to see every ounce of authority and strength drain out of his face, only to be replaced with uncertainty and fear. He opened his mouth, I think perhaps to try and finish his sentence, as if he could somehow reverse what he'd just seen and carry on as normal. But nothing came out, except a quiet croak. It's not real, I stammered, trying desperately to rescue the situation. I reached out and grabbed his wrist and smiled up at him. It's fake, I said. It's just special effects for a film. It's not real. It's okay. When he looked back at me, there was anger in his eyes. The defiant frustration of loss and grief rolled into one. How are you supposed to know? He hissed before walking away. Feeling the rush of events overtake me, 
I restarted my car engine and drove away as quickly as I could, cringing momentarily at the sound of a gunshot ringing out from the stationary police car. By the time I pulled up back outside the facility, it was dark, and I was subconsciously muttering, damn it, over and over and over. I was overtaken by a strange sense of urgency and rushed towards the front doors, only to be stopped by the sight of the building in darkness. The doors were much as I'd left them earlier, and the lobby looked undisturbed. But at night, there was a threatening ambience to its facade that made me hesitate out on the pavement. I nearly turned back, except the buzzing in my head grew stronger at the suggestion. I needed to see what was driving everyone insane, and in that moment, the burning desire steeled my nerves and I marched onwards into the facility, stopping only once to look into the pilgrim's room. I shuddered at the sight of the undisturbed pool of blood, noticing the total ambience of the kneeling corpse. Somewhere in that building, I realized that poor, twisted individual was stalking the dark corridors. And I also realized that, given the size of this place, it was unlikely they were the only ones who'd somehow survived. Still, I made it back to Sutton's office without delay and firmly locked the door behind me. As I expected, the machine used to take retinal photos wasn't exactly the simplest thing to operate, but it wasn't rocket science either. It took around an hour to get working and another hour to move things around so that I could take the picture myself while still looking inside the eyepiece. Meanwhile, I often found strange shadows passing beyond the door as if someone was outside, roaming the halls aimlessly. But whoever it was, I figured that they were paying me no attention, so I ignored them. Eventually, after much messing around, I finally got into position and used my foot to press the button and take a photo. I looked up, almost vibrating with anticipation, only to find the computer monitor a garbled mess of text and colorful lines. After some jagged artifacts ran across the screen, it suddenly fizzled and blacked out, and the computer tower itself gave a loud bang and crack. Suddenly, the only light source in the room died out. I swore profusely as I made my way to a nearby light switch, ready to get some light and then spend all night, if necessary, fixing the damn thing. Except, once switched on, I couldn't help but notice a quiet sort of chittering. It was hard to hear over the sound in my ears, but it was there. Frightened, I slowly panned around the room and noticed nothing out of the ordinary. I held my breath, trying my best to silence every sound in my body, and eventually, even the scratching behind my eyes quietened, and I managed to hear the chittering more clearly. It was close, almost close enough to touch, I realized, when something wet dripped onto my hand. I looked up and saw the pilgrim looming over me from an open ceiling tile. Their eyes were grotesque, like marbles gripped by a ring of pallid flesh, and they had somehow snapped their arm off of the elbow and left their hand and forearm lodged deep in their throat. It dangled from the distended mouth and rugose neck, the skin now thick and scaly like an elephant's hide, and, to my horror, I saw that teeth had started to form around the blooded stump of their severed, half-eaten arm. With its eyes on me, the makeshift mouth began to chitter, and the pilgrim threw themselves at me. Somehow, I managed to step back and wrench the door open, hitting it just as it landed on the very spot where I'd been standing. The blow was hard and sent the thing sprawling across the floor. I rushed out of that room and into the empty hallway where I ran, my feet stampeding down those echoey hallways as that thing scuttled after me like an insect. It was hard to get a proper look at it, but a quick glance over my shoulder saw it lopping after me on three misshapen limbs, its remaining arm having extended further into a sort of cloven foot that it awkwardly used as a crutch to pick up speed. It was fast, able to outpace me in a straight line, but otherwise struggling with corners. Whenever I turned, it would carry on, gibbering hysterically, like it was cackling at a joke, before running headfirst into a wall with a loud crunch. 
it would then stop to shake itself clean before pursuing me once more. Using the twisting corridors, I managed to put enough distance between that thing and myself that I finally reached the lobby. Unfortunately, the way out was one long straight run to the open doors. I knew it would easily catch up with me on the way, but I knew otherwise I had no choice. I barreled down the long hallway, propelling myself as fast as I could when a loud crack came from behind. I did not stop until I reached the outside, where I turned to see the pilgrim impaled on a sharp spike that had emerged from a random door. Slowly, the spike curled around the pilgrim like a spider's leg and dragged its sobbing victim back into the dark. Seconds later, a fountain of blood erupted from the doorway, accompanied by the sound of crunching bone and tearing flesh. On the verge of total panic, I threw myself into my car and left. It was dreadful. After everything, I still didn't have the photo, and even worse, the scratching my head intensified. At one point, I grabbed my rearview mirror and forcefully angled it to face me instead of the road. But somehow, I found I could not see my own eyes. It was like the aura of a migraine, or a natural blind spot. No matter how I angled my head, I couldn't see my own face. It was just blank, a total absence of vision. Worryingly, at one point when I stopped at some red lights, I glanced over at a car to my right, and they looked over at me. It was only in passing, of course, and at first, I thought the look had meant nothing. And yet, as soon as the light turned green, the car beside me veered off the road and plowed to the front of a glass-fronted office building. Shaking, I drove on and tried to act as if nothing had happened, doing everything I could to avert my gaze from any passerby or other drivers. When I finally got home, I felt an immense sense of relief, stopping at my door to catch my breath. Unfortunately, it lasted only a few moments when beyond the threshold, I heard something muttering and cry. That's when I remembered Sutton, and thinking of the pilgrim and whatever had eaten it, I started to wonder if Sutton would be the same as I'd left him. My question was answered as soon as I opened the door, only to find it torn from my grip and something pulling me inside with terrible force. Recess, the voice giggled, its owner a blurring pale shape as I was thrown clear across my room. Slowly, I rolled off my back and started to stand up, carefully making sure I hadn't broken anything. In the darkness, something clicked, and the room filled with light, and there stood the poor, misshapen doctor. Using one of his strange, meter-long arms, he gestured to the walls around me, even stopping to stroke one of my jars. His face, he said, devilish face. Other faces? I replied. More interesting ones? What have you done? He asked, his face perfectly still, and the crescent moon grin fixed in place like a ventriloquist dummies. Instead, the mouth on his neck did all the talking. The effect was quite uncanny, and I watched as he plucked a single book from one of my shelves. I recognized it instantly, irritated, it somehow singled it out. It was a tome that contained hundreds of pages dedicated to the wisdom and power of eyes, specifically the pursuit of truth. Slowly, Sutton gestured first to the book, then to the esoteric materials I had arranged on my desk. Wisdom, he hissed, mocking me with stilted laughter. You know less than any of us. You always will. Yes, I said with a grimace. Knowledge was promised, just not necessarily to me. I should have read the fine print. Truth, Sutton laughed. Yes, I replied. I was looking for truth. It's in your eye. I know. I mustn't exist, he said. Truth did this. He swept his arm down his broken torso, demonstrating exactly what I meant. Awful, awful truth 
must be hidden. I'm leaving, I said firmly. No. Look, I said, taking my car keys out of my pocket and pushing the flat edge of the ignition key against the jelly of my eye. If you come one step closer, I will pop it out like a damn zit. Sudden hissed, drawing air into his tree-like throat through several slit-like openings. Yes, I added. You wouldn't want it to be let out, would you? You don't even know what it is. He growled. I know enough that it's better off inside me than the outside world. To emphasize my point, I pushed the key further into my socket, sliding it gently between my eyeball and the surrounding tissue. The pain was immense, but I imagine it was better than what Sutton had in store for me. Stop! You must let me take it out. You can get lost, I replied, slowly backing towards the door. Others will see. I'll wear sunglasses, I growled and backed further away until I was clean through the door. No! Sudden roared, and I slammed the door shut as hard as I could and ran away even faster, fleeing madly into the night. My only real regret being the total loss of my library collection. Since then, I've waited patiently for some kind of news, but as far as I can tell, the spate of suicides was attributed to a kind of anomaly. It could be a cover-up for all I know, but nor do I particularly care. I am, at least, aware that sudden escape is flat. I've gone through my fair share of hiding places in the interim, and all too often, I find his wretched light bulb shaped head leering at me from distant corners, sometimes peeking out from under passing cars or clutching harmlessly to the top of lampposts. He's patient, I'll give him that. He only needs to catch me when I'm asleep or even just unaware. But even then, there are others, the remnants from the lab, new freaks that I create with every slip and mishap. I'm getting better at remembering the glasses but it is hard when I can't even see my own face. Sometimes I wonder if any wisdom promised by that damned book wasn't meant for me, but perhaps the thing inside me, since it seems to learn more about this world with every day. I can feel it watching through me, and more and more, I feel as if my actions are not my own. Even now, I look back and try to wonder if the courage to stand up the Sutton even came from me. Or something else. Something I can never see or even know. But one day, if you're out of luck, you just might. <laughs>